ये दिख रहे हम रवि हाँ सुना दिया आवाज आ रही है आ रही है हाँ मेरी आ रही है आवाज हाँ परफेक्ट है ठीक है एक चीज की प्रॉब्लम है लेकिन अभी क्या क्या सिस्टम चार्ज नहीं है लैपटॉप चार्ज नहीं है तो लैपटॉप तो चार्ज करना पड़ेगा ना हो गया हो गया हो गया ओके चलो ठीक है डन म्यूट कर दो हेलो राकेश बढ़िया भाई अशोक कपूर सर वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून हेलो आवाज फोटो आ रही है सर आपका ऑडियो नहीं आ रहा है सर मैं बोल रहा हूँ हाँ ठीक है अभी आया लेकिन नहीं आ रहा वहाँ का सॉरी योर वीडियो इज नॉट कमिंग हाँ तो वीडियो ये ये कर रखा है ना प्ले कर रखा है हमने यहाँ पे क्लियर है ठीक है परफेक्ट है परफेक्ट है ना थोड़ा सी लेकिन अभी ठीक है हाँ ठीक है परफेक्ट आवाज एकदम सही है एकदम परफेक्ट परफेक्ट है अच्छा ओके सर ऐसे बैठ जाएंगे जैसे यहाँ पे सर पेपर भी रख देंगे अपना हाँ थोड़ा सा हाँ तो ठीक है हम्म दूर है तो दो तीन पेपर को
हेलो वीडियो बन रही है वीडियो आ गया सर ऑडियो आशीष सर वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून हाँ गुड आफ्टरनून हैव यू एडिटेड द वीडियो सॉरी सर द वीडियो इज नॉट स्टार्टिंग ओके नॉट इज स्टार्टिंग परफेक्ट सर Okay. Actually, the moment we play any file from our end, you know, it, it, during that time it gets off. Okay, thank you. Th thank you so much.
Excuse me, can I, uh, could you hear me? Anyone on the other side? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Could you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello, can you very hear me? Sir. Yes, sir. Very good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes, sir. Properly. Could you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Okay, thank you. Tripathi, sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. That's <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, uh, if I, I'm actually thank you. in a different place. Hope uh, my voice is fine as well as the video. Yes, yes, absolutely fine, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot. Welcome, Radhika. So good to see you. Good to see you as well. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Friends, good afternoon. Hold on a minute. Good afternoon. From abroad also. Good afternoon, Namaskar, ladies and gentlemen. Our warmest greeting to you as uh, you join us from here in India and from so many different countries of the world. My name is Radhika Bajaj, and on behalf of the Institute of Directors India, I'd like to very warmly welcome you all, our very esteemed and distinguished members, uh, associates, and IOD India Global Family to the second edition of the Directors Dialogue Series. We are delighted that today we have a very distinguished guest uh, joining us from India, the USA, UK, various parts of Europe, the UAE, Singapore, Australia, Maldives, Mauritius, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Kuwait, and so on. Your presence really is what makes us a global family of the IOD. A very warm welcome to you all once again. Now, the Institute of Directors India is hosting, as you know, a series of... Sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. Your voice is not clear, ma'am. Okay. Uh, let me disconnect my... Well, I'm speaking from Orisha, and it's okay for me. You can hear it, sir. Your voice is loud and clear, sir. <laughs> uh, is my voice uh, clear? No, better. 
Yes, All Radhika Petra. Thank you. Okay, I'm so sorry for that. So I would uh, once again like to welcome all our uh, distinguished speakers, all participants uh, to this uh, very special series that has been joined uh, by the Institute of Directors. As I was saying, the, the IOD India is hosting a series of special virtual sessions the Director's Dialogue event uh, over the next one year to discuss the future direction in key economic sectors when it comes to sustainability amidst the pandemic. The earlier edition was held on the oil and gas sector and it was hugely successful. And so here we are for the second session. Now, today in the second session, the special focus is on the power and new and renewable energy sector. The team is focusing on an accelerating sustainable energy transitions, director strategy and directions. In today's session, we are honored to have some of the most distinguished and eminent leaders from this sector who have led by example and have inspired us. They will be sharing their insights, strategic perspectives and vast experiences as we prepare for a sustainable and bright future. Our special thanks to Ministry of Power, Government of India and Government of Gujarat State for their kind support and inspiration. A big thank you to all our partners as well, our principal partner, gold, silver and associate partners for their overwhelming support for this special program. Uh, perhaps uh, this event uh, will go down in history as almost all well performing organizations in the renewable energy sector are participating with us today. So in more than one way uh, today, it's going to be a power packed session. So let's kick start the proceedings. Really, I would very warmly like to welcome Mr. Ashok Kapoor, IAS retired, the director general of Institute of Directors India to deliver the opening remarks as well as welcome all our distinguished speakers today. Over to you, Mr. Kapoor. Uh, thank you, Radhika. Uh, thank you, Radhika, and good afternoon to all our friends from India, and uh, good morning or good evening to all our uh, distinguished participants from whichever continent you may have joined. Uh, friends, on behalf of IOD India, I welcome you to today's global webinar on accelerating sustainable energy transitions in power and, and new energy sector of India. Today's theme is both literally and figuratively, the burning issues of the day all over the globe. I can do no better than quote Monsieur Macron, the president of France, and I quote, there's no climate crisis, there is a climate emergency, unquote. The comment by Mr. Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General, is even more shocking. And I quote, our planet is under attack. It is seriously wounded, unquote. In selecting the theme for today, IOD is conscious of the fact that the main finding of the Commission on Climate Change, headed by Mr. Al Gore, the former vice president of USA, is that the climate change and the solution to global energy sector needs not debate or discussion, but concrete action here and now. Uh, Mr. Al Gore, we have only one planet. There is no plan B. Uh, friends, I now invite Lieutenant General J.S. Adwalia, President, Institute of Directors, for his welcome and yes. Uh, thank you, General. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you, Dilla. Welcome, honorable ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome and best wishes on behalf of the Institute of Directors for your good health and happiness. The focus of IOD, a membership based association of corporate directors, is always on the boards for the future and on future directors for the boards. Being the last six months, IOD has been hosting a series of special webinars to discuss future directions for sustainability amid the pandemic in key sectors, especially the last one being oil and gas sector. Today, we focus on power and new and renewable energy sector to discuss the required strategy and directions with a roadmap for this challenge. 
India's renewable energy sector is the fourth most attractive renewable market in the world. India is home to 18% of the world's population, but uses only 6% of the world's primary energy. Still, India's energy security challenge and problems are complex and multidimensional. India is home to 18%, as I said, of the world population, but the world's energy resources are finite. Oil is expected to run out in about 40 years, natural gas in 60 years, and coal in about 200 years. The energy costs and its geopolitical security needs have been increasing at an alarming rate. Interest in environment responsibility is also at an all-time high. The world is facing various energy risks. The energy supply lines need to be secure from geopolitical risks. The power trading has come to stay as a hedge against the financial losses and to smoothen the flow of power. The long-term energy security hinges on the development of renewable energy sources and technology to harness them into commodities. India has to move from oil, gas, and coal-based strategy to nuclear and renewable-based energy sources. India's thorium-based nuclear program can be one of its priority. The world has made great strides in increasing energy efficiency. In India, energy efficiency continues to be a priority for all organizations to become more cost competitive. There is, I would say, 10 to 30% potential of energy saving in any organization. India has a huge market potential for renewables. Renewable energy has matured, is environmentally sustainable, and provides energy access, especially under the decentralized mode. The future potential of solar energy is almost infinite. The solar energy can specially provide electricity needs of over 360 million people of India who are living off the grid. The solar power tariffs have already hit a record low of rupees 2.49 per kilowatt hour, which is below the cost of conventional power. The government of India has set up an ambitious target of 175 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2022. Our solar parks have attracted good interest from global investors, and we are confident of crossing this target. I'm sure our valuable speakers today will bring various options for a winning strategy and a roadmap for India's energy security. I wish you all the best. Thank you. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Upendra Tripathi. Uh, friends, Mr. A.K. Tiwari is held up with the Honorable Minister. Uh, I extend a hearty welcome to another thought leader and renewable energy expert, Dr. Upendra Tripathi. Director General International Solar Alliance and former Secretary, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. He has made exceptional contribution towards achieving 175 gigawatt target and for ushering in policies that transformed India's renewable energy sector between 2014 to 2016. He has headed all the pioneering and engine energy institutions in India and I named them Solar Energy Corporation, the National Institute of Solar Energy, and National Institute of Wind Energy, the National Institute of Bioenergy, the Association of Renewable Energy Agencies of States, and now the crowning glory of his career, the heading the International Solar Alliance. Uh, for these achievements, the Prime Minister of India bestowed the PM's Award for Excellence in Public Administration in 2009 to Dr. Tripathi. 
His numerous other awards include Extraordinary Citizens Award from Rotary International, Central Board of Irrigation and Power, the Award for Outstanding Contribution to India's Renewable Energy Sector, the Lifetime Achievement Award, and UBM 2016 as a Crusader for Renewable Energy. Welcome, Dr. Tripathi. Can you hear me? Can you hear Loud me? and clear, sir. Okay, thank you for those uh, nice words, uh, 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 Mr. Kapoor. And uh, uh, you have been a friend, philosopher, and guide. And uh, uh, I'm very proud to remember uh, Mr. Ahul Walia, for whom I met for the first time. And I'm very happy that the Institute of Directors, uh, as you correctly told, it not only talks about uh, directors of boards, of board, boards of directors. Uh, they have brought a very big uh, and good gathering today. Uh, we have our corporate partners like uh, Gas Authority of India Limited, Gale. We have Irida here. We have SJVN, who are our, our corporate partners. They put in a million dollars each in uh, Aisha. We have also leaders of the renewable energy sector. We have Renew Power, we have Borosil, we have Ravin, we have uh, Hero Future Energy, Avada Group. Uh, and this is a good uh, 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 gathering. And we have, of course, the dynamic. Uh, uh, the financial advisor of our ministry, in fact, without finance, renewable energy will not move. And uh, I know uh, Mr. Asis Upadha, who has been doing you know, excellent work, and uh, Radhika Chah, of course, who is shaping the renewable energy and energy policy in Uttarakhand. With uh, this uh, in the panel, uh, I'm uh, very happy to say that uh, the agenda you have set, you know, this is about accelerating sustainable energy transition, is uh, going to be. Uh, really very meaningful, and this is uh, going to bring in a very powerful strategy. And in fact, if you look at the, you know, the building tomorrow's uh, boards or the building, uh, what you call the strategic partners, uh, you know, the, the motor that we have put, think ahead of your partner. And the Mr. Tripathi, uh, yeah, uh, we are not being able to see you, sir. Could you kindly put on your video? I think I have some uh, restriction uh, of, of the technical issues. So, uh, uh, okay. So, is it not okay. showing you the uh, option? I don't know. The option is fine. I think there is. We can see you now, sir. Okay, good, good. Uh, it says I missed my video capacity or something. Uh, so, they, uh, you know, how to accelerate uh, sustainable energy transition? Uh, the International Solar Alliance plays a very important role in this. And to those who haven't heard much about the International Solar Alliance, this is the first. Uh, a uh, multilateral body headquartered in India. Uh, we are in a place called uh, Gurgaon in National Institute of Solar Energy, which is a brilliant campus of 200 acres of uh, land. And uh, and uh, uh, we have right now around 89 countries who have signed the framework agreement, about 71 countries have ratified. And I'm very happy to announce that uh, last week alone, uh, the first amendment to the framework agreement, which removed the tropical borders, and now uh, lays down that any UN member country, and there are 193 or 194, uh, each UN member country can be a member of AISHA, which means India is going to have a multilateral body in India where it could fly 193 flags of all member nations of UN, and it can build the headquarters of AISHA taking soil from 193 countries. It's going to be a unique office. Now, it is not only the unique office, you know, it's a unique office in the sense that uh, in order to have this energy transition that we are talking about, you know, it has launched seven programs. And uh, uh, I'm not going to deal with uh, programs, which is boring, of course, they deal with, you know, uh, very practical issues like uh, solar pumps, uh, the mini grids, the rooftop, uh, solar vehicles, solar cooling, solar storage, solar parks. But the main theme is that all these programs and the projects that uh, ISA promotes, they aim at the energy transition to make energy more sustainable and more uh, affordable. But uh, there are certain things ISA is unique in doing. No other UN agency or multilateral body does. And, uh, and that unique thing that International Solar Alliance does, and that is where I think entire industry can take help, and ISA and industry are very uh, close at work. A, we have a corporate partnership uh, 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 scheme where uh, we have 16 to 17 corporates who have put in $1 million each and their corporate partners. 
So we sit together and strategize as to how we can actually accelerate the sustainable energy transition in the globe to address climate issues, address climate equity issues, climate justice issues, issues of technology and issues of investment. Uh, and the second thing that we do, uh, we facilitate how to create a market for the industry. Now, I'll give you two examples of what we have done, how actually we are creating a market for the industry. A, to all, other, all member countries, we address a simple letter to the ministers, would you like to give solar farms to the farmers? We got replies, we aggregated the you know, answers we got, and we added, we found that we had got the request from 22 countries, and the request was for 272,000 solar farms. We took help of EESL, we went for a global tender, and I'm very proud and pleased to say that for the first time, a multilateral agency dealt with a global tender and brought down the price by 40%. Ultimately, we had five companies, four from India and one from Denmark, whom we empaneled and then sent those letters to the countries in order to you know, avail finance and uh, pumps. And the second example, which is uh, in, uh, on course, is uh, taking help of ESL. We just tendered for 47 million, we call it home power systems. Now, as you know, there are 750 million people without access to ele electricity. There are 2 billion women who have uh, no access to clean cooking medium. There are 3 billion people who have no clean access uh, to uh, clean drinking water. And uh, World Bank has come and said that at the end of 2030, which is the, you know, the universal deadline for achieving everything that we desire for, still 700 uh, million people will be left without energy access. And that is where I shall uh, come in. So the point that I'm trying to make that in these practical things that we are promoting, the programs that we are floating, our sole uh, uh, aim is to create a market so that these areas of darkness can be lighted up. Now, when I say the areas of darkness, you know, one is, of course, lack of universal energy access. We are talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, affordability of uh, energy and uh, sustainability of energy sources, mismatch between supply and uh, demand. Now, to address those universal issues, again, to, you know, going with the industries together, the two examples I gave is, you know, are the examples what we have done, the solar pumps and the 47 million of home power systems to be auctioned to be tendered every year for next five years. And that makes it roughly 250 million LED bulbs and around uh, uh, 250 million, uh, uh, you know, home power systems, which talks about, you know, uh, home lighting systems. It talks about the solar refrigeration. It talks about solar fans. And of course, it talks about solar uh, televisions. But the two other examples that I'm going to give you, which are, you know, which are in a state of discussion, one is something called the World Solar Bank. We find that uh, uh, despite $150 billion coming to the solar market, it doesn't go to the member countries who need it most or to the industries who need it most. And the access of capital from the industry to the multilateral banks is through the sovereign countries, which puts a lot of constraints in terms of accessing those capitals. So in the World Solar Bank that we have proposed and what the last assembly did, they appointed an international steering committee having France, India, uh, the UK, the Netherlands, we have uh, Fiji and uh, uh, Cuba, we have uh, Nauru, uh, we have uh, Guyana, and this international committee is meeting shortly to address the issue of the framework of this World Solar Bank and of course the headquarters. Now, what I say and this bank will do together they will try to convert, you know, uh, the, the, the necessity or the scarcity into a market. The 3 billion people without clean access drinking water is a market. 2 billion women with no access to clean cooking medium is a market. 700 million people having no access is a market. And we need someone to tap this market, technologies to address this market. And that is where the board of directors, the industries can play a very important role. And uh, instead of having a world divided in terms of energy access, the, we, we, we understand that ISA and the industry can actually address this issue, not in terms of grant and subsidy or charity, but in terms of really creating market, addressing issues of supply and demand. So apart from the World Solar Bank, the second example that I gave is 
uh, that we are proposing uh, something called one sun, one world and one grid. This is the famous uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, you know, message uh, in the 2018 founding uh, uh, conference when he wanted ISA to be the OPEC of the world so far as solar energy is concerned. But when we talk about one sun, one world, one grid, it is not actually a ring around the Saturn or it is not a ring around the necklace around the uh, neck. It's not that plain, simple, circular. We are talking about major cities and towns where there is a mismatch between demand and supply of energy, when there is a need for correction about the sources of energy to be compliant with the, uh, the uh, famous COP21 Paris Agreement. And we are talking about addressing the issues of energy efficiency. And we are talking about capital. We are talking about technology. We are talking about manpower. And of course, we're talking about the land that you need for the one sun, one world, one grid, and the policy framework, a global policy framework, which will address this type of uninterrupted power supply. And what are the three essence that we're talking about? We're talking in the one sun, one world, one grid. We're not talking too much of lithium battery. We're talking about time as battery, which means each zone of earth can work at a time because each zone uh, which is exposed to the sun is a source of power. And we are essentially trying to connect the points of high consumption and address the management issues so that we feel that it is possible. And those who think that one sun, one world, one grid is not possible, it is theoretical, it is ambitious, I would like them to talk, uh, to uh, learn about a company, uh, uh, you know, uh, a company in Australia. I won't name it, but it is right now planning to use the Australian deserts and 7,500 kilometers of transmission line to generate power in the deserts of Australia and supply those powers to Singapore. Because they made a study that the current cost of power in Singapore is so costly, they can uh, generate, uh, meet the cost of generation, cost of transmission, still supply power to Singapore at a cheaper rate by utilizing some of the islands of Indonesia, which come in between. Now, out of the 7,500 uh, kilometers we are talking about, almost 3,500 kilometers will be submarine, which means under the sea, the power cables will move. I'm also, you know, giving the example of the Gujarat desert where 30,000 megawatt of power production could be supplied to the Gulf countries. Now, uh, of course, when we are talking about transition of energy, technology plays a very major role. And in history, if we look at, you know, when Europe ran out of wood, uh, you know, the coal came in. When we ran out of fuel oil in history, kerosene came in. So it is a question of, you know, continuous play between the industry, the demand and supply from the society, the type of research and technology that we do. So I'm sure the role that Institute of Directors plays, which, is, which I adore and respect and uh, I admire, that this is the bed where directors' dialogue really plays an important role. And some of, uh, you know, most of you must have read about this book, Republic by Plato, which talked how dialogue played a role in the Socratic sense of epistemology or science of uh, knowledge. Essentially, you say something, you contradict that, and you come out with a essentially mixed conclusion or a synthesis conclusion. And from Socrates, you know, it went right up to Hegel, then to Karl Marx, where he talked about thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And this dialogue, you know, and the directors, essentially, they promote, uh, uh, you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis in the world of markets, economics, economies, and industries. So when we are talking this dialogue of taking to energy, sustainable uh, transition of energy, sustainable transition is a meaning that the carbon budget that we have must come down. Each director actually makes a table, you know, how much his or her industry or their industry uses in terms of carbon energy today. Is it at 0%? Is it at 10%? Is it at 50%? Is it at 75%? 199%. So if each industry can actually make a table that what type of carbon neutrality or carbon footprint they have and make a roadmap, say by 2030 or 2050, they can be 100% neutral, that really makes sense. And that is not only true of each industry, it is true of each economy. And it's true of energy transition. When we switch over from biomass to coal, at some point, the entire power from coal was only 1% of global energy demand. 
but from one person at some point it moved to 99 percent and today that is the story of solar that is the story of wind today solar is three percent but they'll be in very short time they will be moving into green hydrogen and other solar derivatives the way we are mixing up different type of heat and light from the sun to be exploited in the form of energy the type of technologies that are moving bifacial panels tiger panels and we are talking about uh, you know thermodynamic panels we are talking about solar ink we are talking about 3d printing we are talking about using hot air to generate power uh, uh, the point is that the, the 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 real bed through which the society moves is industry and industry of course is the board of directors how imaginatively we play and how we actually you know meet the demand of society how we shape how we dream the dream of the directors actually saves the dream of the society and they're interlinked they're absolutely interlinked and isa plays the critical role of bringing the industry and society together via the solar and uh, i'm again once again i'm very grateful to iod uh, particularly mr kapoor and uh, mr alwalia whom i know for decades and uh, i admire their efforts for you know bringing such dialects i'm uh, very thankful and i thank you once again for having given me this opportunity i'm sure the industries who have come together today uh, will take uh, some sort of result that by 2030 they will have zero carbon footprint in their industrial energy consumption and they will move from to renewable not only in terms of energy generation but all the vehicles they will use they will be electric vehicles and all the heating and cooling they will use will not use coal power and when i say they will not use it i'm not talking uh, because i don't believe in charity and sacrifice and all that uh, uh, unless it is actually really focused and uh, uh, you know uh, based on needs but when i say an industry will not use electric will use electric vehicles what i mean is that they will save money when i say the industry will you will use uh, not thermal energy for cooling and heating will use solar i mean they will have such technologies where it will be financially beneficial for them to switch over to renewable and that is precisely what the industry has done the way the you know solar power cost has come down the way the future of uh, renewable energy looks like, the way we are going to use solar for green hydrogen. And this is where the industry leads. And this is where IOD is playing a very important role. Thank you once again to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Tripathi. Uh, before I invite the next uh, distinguished speaker, uh, I'm glad to announce that Honorable Saurabh Bhai Patel, the Cabinet Minister of Energy from Gujarat, is amongst us. Uh, friends, it gives us great pleasure to announce that amongst us today is one of the most amongst us today is one of the most distinguished speakers and thought leaders from India. I especially welcome Shri Ashish Upadhyay, IAS, Senior Additional Secretary and Financial Advisor, Ministry of Power. A brilliant scholar, Ashish has a PhD in business administration and a master's in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School, USA. He has done pioneering work in the coal sector in India as, a, as earlier joint secretary in the Ministry of Coal. He's one of the most knowledgeable experts in India today on coal. Uh, I welcome Mr. Ashish Upadhyay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Kapoor and uh, fellow panelists. I consider it as a privilege that this opportunity is being given to me. I'll try to give a scenario, a broad scenario of how power sector is unfolding itself in India. And then I'll leave some questions for you to decide how the future course of action should be. Uh, in my opinion, uh, power sector in India, in India started changing with the turn of the century when uh, we started concentrating on availability of power to all our citizens. The first challenge, of course, was generation. In first and second decades of this century, we worked tremendously on it. And now, fortunately, we have reached a stage where if not in uh, surplus, we have self-sufficiency in power. 
In fact, we have a generation capacity of 375 gigawatt in comparison to the demand. Maximum demand incidentally was recorded yesterday, which was 186 gigawatt. It's a good thing that we have got access capacity, but at the same time, it poses a challenge before us. And the challenge is that we have to give fixed cost to maintain this generation capacity, additional generation capacity, which puts a load on the cost of electricity in the country. It makes it slightly costly. When, if you look at Western countries, there generally the capacity is 60 to 70 percent lower than what we have, and they meet the demand more efficiently. So we'll have to work in, in increasing efficiency if we want to lower the cost of the electricity which is being supplied in the country. Second factor in electricity supply is generation. Fortunately, in the last two decades, we have worked well. And now we have got capacity to transform, uh, to transmit any amount of energy being produced in one part of the country to the other part. Solar or other renewable energy being site specific, we require, we had to require this strengthen, strengthening of the transmission system where the demand is and where the generation is taking place. Today, fortunately, we are in a position where it is fully met and there are hardly uh, any instances of long congestion or much congestion, more or less is. But this does not make us satisfied that we have got enough energy, we have got enough generation uh, transmission capacity. Even then, there is one sector which is particularly becoming a tough area for us to challenge, and that is transmission. India's biggest challenge in uh, energy sector is transmission. Uh, sorry, distribution. Distribution is mainly done through state discounts, and state discounts have got their own challenges. In Electricity Act 2003, it was envisaged that discounts will be at arm's length and will be a commercial uh, entity. They will be at arm's length from the state government. But somehow, in last 17 years of working on this act, we have not been able to achieve that objective. And there are a couple of issues which aids the discount and in, the, in turn affects the energy sector in the country. One, of course, is poor metering and collection network. And that leads to ANT, uh, ATNC losses. We all know the ATNC losses are quite huge and uh, different attempts being done in the past have not been, we have not been able to uh, get it at the trajectory where it wanted it to be. In project today, we wanted to take it to less than 15% by 2018 and 19, but it is still higher than that. And of course, ACS and ARA gap is also quite high, and DISCOMs have not been able to sustain supply at that. Uh, with the gap increasing. They require money to purchase power from generator, but the realization of revenue by sale of that power is not forthcoming. And that gap is the major challenge which India's power sector is facing right now. It keeps on increasing. In the beginning of COVID crisis, the major challenge was to keep the power flowing. And in order to help it, Government of India had come out with a package of rupees 90,000 crores to improve the liquidity in the system. The loans were advanced. Of course, 127,000 crore, subsequently it was increased to. Almost all loans have been sanctioned and about 50,000 crores have been disbursed as well. But the gap between the ACS and AR is continuing and is becoming a major challenge for us. Some regions are cross subsidy. There are a lot of subsidies which we, which most of the governments are giving, but realization of the cost of the subsidy is low or sometimes is not forthcoming at all. Is late, which makes it costlier further. 
Then, of course, tariff fixation. In a couple of states, tariffs have not been fixed for many years, where the cost of production of energy is going up day by day. So that gap affects the distribution sector and in turn makes the availability of energy difficult. And last but not the least are the accounting and management issues of the discounts. And these factors together makes it difficult for uh, an average person to get cheap energy or for industry to get energy at a reasonable cost where their products can become competitive in the market. So this is a major challenge right now in front of our uh, sector, which we'll have to find solutions to. We are working, of course, uh, continuously to resolve these issues. And by and by, I think we will be able to, within the next three, four years, the major action will be in the distribution sector. But at the same time, I would like to point out some more issues for the consideration of the August weather. Number one, the falling prices of RE is a challenge. In last auction, it has broken the barrier of rupees two, and now it is 1.99 rupee per unit. With this fall, uh, fall in the prices, there is a lot of rush towards acquiring this energy, but this energy as on trade has got its own technological challenge. It's not stable. It makes it difficult for us to stabilize the grid. And that is why we have to work how to store this energy. Till the storage mechanism comes in place, it can help only to a limited extent. Of course, uh, Mr. Tripathi talked about the one globe, one sun, one grid. Concept. It's a beautiful concept. It will work, and if it if we are able to achieve it, it will certainly help us in lowering and the cost of the energy and making it affordable. Because in our country we have reached at one rupee ninety nine paisa per unit, but in middle uh, mid east it has reached almost rupee one per unit. So if we can link through underground cables to see our generation our consumption centers to the energy being generated there. It can help us in solving the problem of getting it at a cheaper and affordable price. Then, of course, the second trend, which is visible with this drastic fall coming with the renewable energy, is that the PPA regime is under acute threat. All the discounts at power purchase agreements, which run for 15, 20, 25 years at a higher price, at that time, four rupees anything between four to five rupees with the coming of this new energy at one rupee 99 paisa or two rupee 30 paisa or two rupee 50 paisa the overall available energy prices are falling down so states are hesitating in going and binding themselves with long-term epas that's good that makes sense and ultimately it will uh, we will have to move to that direction only and most of the energy will be traded through energy exchanges. But in turn, it is, it is bringing another problem. And that problem is the problem of financing the sector. If there are no long-term PPA, bankers and financial institutions are not willing, they're not forthcoming to finance the sector. And it will lead to stagnation until, unless we come with an acceptable formula, acceptable solution, which satisfies all stakeholders, we'll have some uh, roadblocks here. Another factor which is now coming into picture of in last one year or one and a half year, that is some of the stranded generation units have gone to NCLT and NCLT has given a resolution almost as a half of the cost of the original estimate of that uh, generating unit. This has resulted that all these resolved units now are claiming the fixed cost as the resolved uh, prices, which are much, much cheaper than original cost. So, in turn, the energy is becoming cheaper, and in merit order dispatch, their energy will come first, 
what will happen to the old working power stations that is a challenge for that we will have to find out some solution we will have to resolve it somehow now last but not the least in our journey so far the last attention the least attention has been on the one who sustains this whole sector and that is consumer fortunately government of india has come up with a consumer citizen uh, rights charter which was declared on 31st december 2020 and we hope then gradually we will try to put consumer in the center stage we'll try to uh, give him not only round the clock energy but we'll also try to give him choices and once we start working in that direction Certainly, this, not only the citizen of this country, but also all those players who are involved in supply, in transmission, in generation, or in any other way with the sector, they will get benefit. I'll stop here. I'll again thank IOD to give me an opportunity to speak. And I hope our discussion will try to find out solution to some of these challenges which are emerging in the sector. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, I now have the pleasure of inviting uh, Mrs. Radhika Jha, Secretary to the... Thanks, Ashish. Uh, I have the pleasure of now welcoming Mrs. Radhika Jha. IS, Secretary to the Chief Minister and Secretary Department of Energy and Renew Energy and Renewable Energy, uh, Uttarakhand. She has a Master's in Organizational Behavior from the Delhi University and Certified National Level Leadership Trainer for Public Administrator, Administrator by the Center for Creative Leadership USA. She has received the highest state level award for excellence in good governance in 2020. And her heartbreaking article, Rebooting the Power Sector, published in Times Now last year, has won international recognition. Radhika has initiated Chief Minister's Good Governance Awards to recognize commendable work at all levels. She has been recognized as one of the top 50 effective Indian civil servants for creating a new benchmark of performance in public service by the Fame magazine, Asia Post, and PSU Watch. Radhika is the author of Solar Energy Policy 2018 with the aim of green power generation and livelihood enhancement in the hilly terrains in India. She has implemented the first ever power generation from pine needle policy 2018. She is the only lady specialist in India's power sector to be the chairperson for all three state power corporations, in addition to being the Secretary, Energy and Renewable Energy Department. Radhika, friends, has not only broken the glass ceiling, but smashed it to smithereens. Welcome, Radhika. Thank you so much, sir. So am I audible? Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to, at the outset, convey my gratitude to Kapoor, sir, and to this director's dialogue, which has been initiated. I am humbled by the introduction, sir. It was just part of my duties, which I was discharging in this sector and in my assignment in the civil services. I would like to also greet the esteemed panelists. Uh, Upadhyay sir is here. There are other panelists also who are distinguished in this sector. I would like to convey my heartfelt gratitude to all of you, sir. Uh, so just, uh, I was hearing Upadhyay sir, uh, and I think sir has raised very relevant issues about the sector and how it can be made sustainable, sir. 
Uh, with my experience of this Himalayan state, I worked for a brief while uh, with the central government as well. But considering my experience over here, sir, there are three, four constructs which I wanted to share uh, with the esteemed panel over here, sir. First, of course, sir, the order of the day which I feel is going to be the RE sector. And this is what I also wrote last year, that we have to reinvent ourselves to focus on RE in all forms, whether it is hydro, solar, or any other form which is unconventional, sir. But so there are a lot of issues in terms of grid connectivity, a lot of issues in terms of sustainability. Hydro sector particularly has seen a decline over the last couple of years. Uh, so I think first we need to focus is on grid stability via the hydro sector, in which I think Government of India's policy, which has been enunciated in March of 2019, needs more clarity. It needs to fill up a lot of gaps which are still there how VGF would be done, how it would see the light of the day. If that VGF policy happens, I think the hydro sector is going to be catapulted to better heights in times to come. So that is, of course, one take, because grid stability and long-term cost would only be feasible if we were to promote hydro. Second, of course, solar, Uttarakhand has had a very rich experience. We have allocated around 203 megawatts just to share the personal experience in the hilly terrain. We need to focus on retaining our agricultural land, you know, to begin with. A lot of states, I think, are doing the mistake of also doing solar on productive lands. Our state has taken a view. We would do solar on wastelands or in the higher reaches where agriculture or any kind of productivity is really not possible. So I think this is one thing which we all need to look at as stakeholders in this uh, space that we also need to have a foresight in terms of how we want to, uh, you know, balance the entire sector vis-a-vis -vis livelihood, food security, et cetera. So this was one thing which we have been focusing upon. Uh, in the COVID economic crisis, which has emerged across the world and the country, Uttarakhand has uh, made a new scheme called CM Solar Sarozgar Yojana. So that's in Hindi, which just says that anyone could do solar farming and government is going to buy that power from them. And we would, of course, also subsidize them up to 35%. So which has been very interesting and it has seen a lot of appreciation from our people because people really had livelihood crisis in, in these times. So this uh, uh, scheme of ours has helped us reach out to the last man who could put a little solar 25 kilowatt plant and uh, do livelihood generation likewise. So I would like to urge that we need to look at RE and look at livelihood together. We have to look at the entire sector space and understand how livelihood could also be dovetailed into this. So like we in Uttarakhand talk about green economies. You know, where there is, of course, focus on green power generation by hydro or solar. And, of course, we look at how economic uh, livelihood could be enhanced. In Uttarakhand, we have also made the pine needle policy, which is one of a kind. And the hilly states could actually adopt this policy. It is interesting because pine needle leads to a lot of forest fires. It also spoils the ecology to a large extent. So if these pine needles are collected, we have a gasifier, I mean, a basic gasifier, converts it into power and we feed it into the grid. So this is once again a model which I would just like to share, and especially in the hilly terrain, it is possible. Of course, since we are going to focus on sustainable energy transitions, I would not particularly talk about, uh, you know, the reforms which could be done in the distribution sector, which I think all of us are aware of. And of course, in the transmission sector, transmission sector is already seeing the TBCB model, which would be, you know, which would be a reality in times to come for all projects. So I think TBCB model is something which will reduce cost and uh, help us honor the timelines. Distribution sector, of course, we need a full session to talk about the reforms of metering, billing, smart metering, revenue realization. Uh, but uh, I was just reading news somewhere which said that uh, we have witnessed the highest peak demand, which means the economy is back on track, the world economy and the national economy. Uh, there are a couple of suggestions which I have also shared with the Ministry of Power and if Ashish sir is still with us, 
uh, there is a requirement to make an interministerial group of power, water resources, forest, and even some state governments, which could look into understanding better ways of harnessing renewable energy. How uh, issues of environment could be tackled simultaneously. And this IMG could also have private stakeholders into it. We could also have international experts onto it to understand how India could, you know, uh, take this uh, frog uh, jump into the sector like we have done in a lot of other sectors. So I, uh, in fact, have been insisting on this. The hydro policy, the VGF thing is something which we need to take up. And another sector which solar can actually uh, be, a, I mean, it could be a game changer in the solar sector is floating solar, which of course saves our land. So we in Uttarakhand have identified uh, water bodies where we could take solar and we have also initiated bids regarding that in association with SECI. So that's again something which uh, we as a group can focus on. Of course, the rooftop scheme has been doing very well in the RE sector. Government of India should continue with the rooftop scheme and it could be made mandatory. Like a lot of Scandinavian countries have a lot of mandatory rules for their green buildings. Our states do have it, but we don't really enforce it. So I think the need of the hour is to also enforce that, which of course uh, can uh, make the energy sector viable in its own way. In Uttarakhand, uh, I would like to share, I, I should not run out of time. Uttarakhand, we've also made an interesting model of assembling LED lights, okay, by using women's self-help groups. So when we are talking of RE, accelerating the sector, we need to take a holistic view. So what we've done is, just quickly, we have made small women's self-help groups. We give them raw material, and they actually assemble LED bulbs, LED tube lights, and even decorative lights. So what is happening is we are able to cater to the local market and we are also generating employment for these women folk. This has been identified as a good practice even by the ADB and they are also planning to fund us on these two, three practices. Uh, regarding the CapEx requirement in this sector, I think it is important to tap the EAP funding because a lot of state governments are I mean, they know that they need that kind of strengthening into the sector, but they really don't have that kind of bandwidth. So I think it's also important that government of India gets in touch with EAP, I mean, you know, banks, whether it is ADB, AIBB, World Bank, et cetera, so that uh, CapEx infuse, uh, infusion could be done uh, from these in order to strengthen the sector. Uh, reforms could be uh, taken in a very systematic manner. We could have a white paper on the reforms. And in fact, I would urge Kapoor, sir, uh, we would be happy to volunteer if there could be a paper on reforms in the RE sector, which would accelerate and see India where we really want it to be. We all could contribute and then present it to the power ministry and uh, seek time from them, make a presentation. And it, it becomes an overall uh, understanding on the way the sector has to you know, take the lead. And of course, lastly, I would like to re-emphasize uh, the importance of hydro. We have been talking a lot of solar because the rates have been reasonable and it has been uh, more lucrative to get into solar now. But finally, we will have to look at more sustainable options. Uh, so my, of course, suggestions would be that the chain entirely needs to be integrated. And this IMG, if, if it happens and we get into making a white paper and presenting it to the ministry, I'm sure the voice of all the stakeholders, whether it is uh, this forum or the private sector, we all could uh, make a point and it could be a win-win situation for everyone. Uh, I'm open to questions, if any, or suggestions, if any. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure today to welcome amongst us uh, Shri Saurabh Bhai Patel, the Honorable Minister of Energy, Government of Gujarat. Uh, Honorable Shri Saurabh Bhai Patel is the guest of honor for all of us, and he will now deliver the keynote address. Uh, friends, Saurabh Bhai is an intellectual par excellence and a man of action. 
different Gujarat Global Model Meets, which is one all India recognition. A member of Gujarat Legislative Assembly since 1998, Saurabh has served the state in all the departments that you can imagine that a government has. His experience as a minister is unique. Currently, he's in charge of energy and petrochemicals and is the force behind the success of the state in promoting renewable energy. He has successfully implemented the VAT Act and the Fiscal Responsibility Act in the state. Before a global audience today that has assembled. And I quote, it is paramount to stay relevant in a rapidly changing market scenario, unquote. The business and industry in India feel that the, the absence of Sorubai in the union cabinet is a loss for India, but a gain for the state of Gujarat. Honorable Shri Sorubai Patel, the guest of honor. Thank you for inviting me today to the seminar. I'm glad to be present. Good afternoon. Well, the energy sector is changing very fast. I became a minister first in 2002 and practically have an energy department since last 18 years. I've seen lots. I remember those days when we had overdues to the tune of 2,200 crores, losses to the tune of 2,000 crores every year. I can tell you the energy sector can state only and only if there is a political will of the government. If there is no political will of the government, irrespective of whatever the policy the central government comes, irrespective of the policy the state the political will can only reduce your TND losses. And no dis if TND losses are not reduced. We were lucky to have Honorable Shinarendra Bhai Modi ji. And during his period, years, in starting from four discoms, started making profits. And in the last 15 years, there is not a single year where we have not made a minor profit. We don't have an ROI of 12% or 14%. We keep the minimum rate. Our discoms can manage the funds on their own. And the center in all these years have given the top four ratings to our four discoms. So that is the internal competition which we have. So I'm glad the good days which we're having today. I still remember the changes in the energy sector. In 2003, the Electricity Act came into being. The laws came in where bidding process started for cooling. And Gujarat was the first to take the lead in 5,100 megawatts of long term, 25 years. We are very happy that got time, irrespective, in spite of the fact that not a coal, single coal mine is in the state of Gujarat. All were based on imported coal. Now, looking in those days and looking today, there's a huge difference. Today, coal mines is not an attraction. Today, the attraction is renewable because every state today looks at what is the cost of power, whether it is wind or whether it is hydro, or whether it is solar. The first priority is to get the rates down. We in Gujarat has always taken the lead. And I still remember when the first solar was given by the state in 2010. The rates were 2010 was rupees 15 per unit. And 500 megawatts were given at 2. At, uh, 500 megawatts were given at rupees 15. And today, we had the lowest rate at 1.99. At the time, and I still remember when going to the Honorable Sri Narendra Bay, 15 rupees, he said that we have 
to show the nation the way and gujarat has to lead so don't worry about the rate give it and everyone will follow and that is how the progress which we are seeing today and today even if you look at the center the way they are working that is the reason we got 1.99 about two about a month back that is the lowest rate so gujarat is going way ahead to fulfill the dreams of our honorable prime minister earlier we talked about gigawatts by 2022 now we are talking about 450 gigawatts had around so total conventional we have around 19000 megawatts renewable by 3132020 that is this we are 10000 in next two years time we are adding 12000 megawatts so from 37% we will reach 50% of now this is by multiple ways we are doing it we have one is going to competitive bidding bid the competitive bidding process is two ways one on government land on another the private player gets his own land now if you look at the competitive bidding process the last 1.99 was on private land so the selection was done by the private player and on 1.99 rate on a long term epa signing so box they on go and like radha nesha dolera we bid so today we have bid it for 4650 megawatts and i expect this 4650 private players and government usually our ppa one sign is completed in a span of 15 months so even if the ppa takes some time after the the total process will be completed in maximum span of 2 years now uh, what i should share with you is we have very aggressive as far as small solar capacity are concerned say point from 500 kilowatt to 4 megawatts nearing a substation the came was 2.63 so we have come out with a policy plus 20 paisa which you give which has been approved by the regulator on 283 we gave an ad in the newspapers and we received 12000 applications total 8000 megawatts next to the substation completed in the next 12 to 15 months after signing of ppa i expect that out of the 8000 megawatts at least 4000 to 5000 megawatts will materialize at the rate on 2.83 now this rates is valid till 31st march because the new rates will be 2.20 now in this 283 it is comfortable with us because it, we don't have to pay any transmission charges it is on 11 kva 66 kva and it is where the usage of power is so no transmission cost or no new substations have to be erected by us so this is something to such a massive scale as far as this is i'm not talking about couple, a month back or something it is one of the most aggressive policies the country we have given complete freedom to Sir, we are unable to hear you, sir. What? Hello. Perfect. Now it's all set. Thank you. Uh, I want to say that this captive policy of ours is going to change the whole working style of 
generation and usage of power. Anyone can generate power, use the power, and sell the power which is remaining. So what will happen? Every manufacturing unit, LT or HT, can generate as much power as they want. If there is any power remaining, he will sell it to us at a fixed price. The price will be 75% of the last bid. So that means he is making money. Captive generation, which he's using, he is not making money on his. This is one thing which we have done. Second thing, collective ownership. That like housing scheme. The way the housing scheme comes up, builds houses and gives it to the residential. The same way a group of people or a developer can develop 500 kilowatts, one watt, and give it to captive, sell it to them, and they can use it for their own purpose. So when there is a complete change, so what we expect that lot of rooftop, practically warehouses, and everyone will be starting generating a power, using the power, and selling the remaining to us at the cost, which is 25%, Lower than so, GVNL doesn't have to lose money on that. The excess, if he's drawing during night or during the daytime, also he will be generating, he will be paying at the existing rate. So, that is one thing we introduce banking charges. We have introduced at the front, he has to pay the banking charges. He doesn't have wheeling charges, would be applicable as per jerk. Surcharge or by the capital company. So we expect our industries to grow a saving of rupees two to rupees four minimum for captive users is foreseen. And that will bring in additional generation of power, additional uh, VAT, our GST, additional employment, additional production. So this is what we are doing on a very big scale. Another one thing which we have done is largest solar renewable park in the world. Our Honorable Prime Minister, just like the foundation stored, 60,000 hectares of unused land lying in Kutch, next to the border of Pakistan, 30,000 megawatts is our target to generate from this, the largest anyway in the world. The transmission network is going to for at least 50 to 60 thousand power to be taken outside the state. 30, 40 percent power will be used in the state. So this is also one thing. And I think we'll do it in the next 10 years. Massive infrastructure is being created by the government, like roads, transmission is also going to be planned in a big way. But our objective is that in the next 10 years, this thing would be done on the 72,000 hectares of land. So, I always take the lead. But what I personally feel is that changing very fast. No one had visualized in 2002 what the roadmap is going to be. I personally think also that whatever healthy discussions which we are having today, maybe 10 years down the line, technology will move fast. Thoughts, and because the movie. The, the, the technology which changes very fast. I think the days are not far where complete usage would be at, I mean, complete generation would be at the usage level. We won't be requiring much of transmission networks at the time. A lot of storage capacities might come in also, so we can resolve that uh, huge uh, problem. Today, the wind capacities using a lot of transmission network also, the generation, solar generation also using a lot of transmission network. We have come up, one unique thing which you also come up is, we have 83 million units during days, I mean by the farmers, every day. We are transferring this 83 million units completely during daytime. We are spending 3,500 crores on infrastructure on transmission, building up that additional transmission network. Daytime to the farmers. So we expect that in the next five to seven years, lot of solar generation will come up. 
and because of the solar generation coming up, the cost of power of solar will be much less even in the exchange. So we can use it cheaper for a farmer because today government of Gujarat is spending 8,000 crores as subsidy every year only for the agriculture farmers of 18 lakh farmers because the water tables are very low. So we have started out of 80,000 villages have been converted during daytime and in the next two and a half years by spending the 3,500 crores on infrastructure, we'll complete our total thing, day power to the farmer. So these are the the center's policy also, and we are we have the dreams of our honorable prime minister. We have decided that we will remain number one. In right now we 860 megawatts we are going to convert household in next three years today we have all another 40 50,000 work is pending and this is we just started the scheme about one and a half years so we are very aggressive on rooftop our wind we are second right now and i think seki out of the 10,000 megawatts of seki wind 7,000 is in the state of Gujarat, which I have not calculated. So by the time Sekhi's all the winds come in, in wind also. So Ari, in next two, three years, 100% I'm very confident that we'll be number one, we'll be way ahead than other states as far as renewable energy is concerned. As our Honorable Prime Minister is showing the world the way forward, Gujarat will show the nation renewables are concerned. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. That was a very erudite keynote at test. We are thankful to you also for the large scale participation of the Gujarat government today. Sir, in the normal course of things, but for COVID, we would have been in Dubai today and thereafter in London. So I hereby take this opportunity to invite you to our next uh, convention, such convention in London and then in Dubai, COVID, whenever it permits. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sir, uh, now, friends, friends, uh, now it gives me pleasure to invite. Uh, Mr. Anjani Kumar Tiwari, Director of Finance, Gale, Limit, Gale Limited, Imaharatna Company. Uh, Mr. Tiwari is the IOD's dialogue, dialogue, Director's Dialogue Series. He is the chairman of that. He has rich and wide experience spanning over 38 years in various sectors across the oil and gas industry and the city gas distribution set sectors. With 25 ex years experience dedicated to Gale across various business segments, he is credited for steering the prestigious Jagdishpur, Haldia, and Bokaro Dharma pipeline, popularly known as the Pradhan Mantri Urja Ganga all over India and abroad. He also serves as Director Gale Gas Limited Green Gas, Hagenagar Gas, Gale Gas USA, and Gale Global USA LNG, and has ensured effective, sustainable, strategic, and result oriented decision making in board functioning. Uh, he was instrumental in charting out the Gale strategy 2020 towards diversification and plan implementation. He was involved in Gale's strategic takeover initiative of Konkan LG, acquiring LNG terminal of 5 MMPT. By being a director in Gale Gas USA and Gale Global USA, Mr. Tiwari could be described as the energy ambassador of India. Mr. Tiwari, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashok Kapoorji, DG IOD. Uh, General J.S. Alwalia ji, President IOD, Sri Pradeep Chaturvedi ji, Vice President for Nice Introduction. 
I heartily welcome respected Saurabh Bhai Patel Ji, Honorable Minister of Energy, Government of Gujarat, Sri Upendra Tripathi Ji, DG, uh, International Solar Alliance, Sri Suman Sinaji, uh, CMD Renu Power, Sri Asi Supadhyay Ji, Joint uh, Additional Secretary and Financial Advisor, Ministry of Power, Government of India, Sri PK Das Ji, uh, CMD Elda, Sri Pradeep. Kureka Ji, Chairman, Gujarat Borosils, Sri Sushul Kumar Sarma Ji, Director, Electrical, SJVNL, Sri Vijay Karya Ji, CMD, Revin Group of Companies, Madam Radhika Jha from Government of Uttarakhand, and Sri Sunil Jain Ji, CEO, Hero Future Energies, Prasant Chaube Ji, Senior Vice President, Avida, and Moderator, Jimmy Greer, and all the participants attending the program through virtual mode on Director's Conclave. Good afternoon and namaskar to all. It's, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to be uh, with you during second series for Director's Dialogue organized by IoT. The first dialogue was on oil and gas. The response and takeaway was excellent, which motivated for the dialogue on power and new and new renewables uh, with the theme accelerating sustainability energy transition director's strategy and directions. I would like to give some words perspective and the, my thought on the energy transition. As we know that India is not placed well in terms of per capita global average consumption of energy in comparison with many developed and developing countries. The per capita energy consumption in India is only at 105 kilowatt hours, whereas other developing countries are much more. So the data shows that there have been ample chance for growth and development of energy consumption in developing countries. The developed, developing and underdeveloped countries have different ways of energy uses as well as energy transition and have different sustainability measures as well as parameters, which every country strives for. To be more precise, energy transition is a dynamic process and is a complex subject, it's not a simple subject, it's a complex subject and further, further energy transition means different to different nations, especially in the developing world. Many developing nations, including India, are advised to move beyond natural gas for energy, energy uses when they are still stuck up severely with the energy poverty. The different form of energy, climate, technology, innovation, and class of nations to place a spare capacity, means whatever the spare capacity is there to different consuming countries forces energy transition by all and therefore is not static. Energy transition are not new. They have been going for a long time and unfold over a time. Previous energy transition have primarily been driven by technology, economics, environment, consideration as well as convenience and ease. The current one has a politics, policy, and activism more mixed in. So the energy transition is a measure to rebalance geopolitics in the world by different countries. Further, finance and energy investments have become a new arena for climate and places sustainability at the center of our investment approach. As we know that the global CO2 emission from fuel consumption by major countries shows that the China has 29%, United States 15%, Europe has 12%, whereas India has only 7%. So the human influence on the climate based on the CO2 emission is loud and clear and further emission of greenhouse gases are the highest in the history. I feel that the cost of energy transition will be big but the cost of inaction to curb the emission will be much bigger. To my mind, the alarm about climate is greater, great motivator for the energy transition in the present world. Whether the transition to a climate neutral economy will improve or hurt growth is a quantitative issue. Unfortunately, we know too little about it while arguing that the prosperity depends long term on decarbonization. Energy transition could only be thought in India, taken into consideration on the new global map of energy-based innovation 
and dramatic shift in the geopolitics and energy. How climate concerns are reshaping the shape of energy and how much discussed energy transition from fossil fuel to renewables may actually play out in the Indian context. A lot of things are not being taken into account when the discussion happens around renewables and electric vehicles. There are around 3 billion people in developing nations who are still subject to indoor air pollution, the greatest environmental health risk according to WHO. India, soon to be the most populous country in the world, has 300 billion people living on mere less than uh, $2 per day. And condition India fairly demonstrate how energy transmission had different meaning for developing nations. Energy transition in India has multiple dimensions. For example, it could mean moving from wood and waste to fuel to commercial fuel, which is less hazardous. And it can mean focusing on achieving growth rate to lift people out of the poverty. India has struggled with inadequacy of the modern energy since long, and more than half of the Indian population has been using biomass. Half of the energy requirement and more than 75% of the electric generation, electricity generation is dependent on the coal in India. Further, 30% of the energy generated from the oil, but 85% of the oil is imported, creating issues like uh, energy security and balance of payment vulnerability when the oil price spikes. So, whereas the natural gas is only 6% of the total energy compared to the global average of 25%, modern renewables that is solar, wind, hydro, and nuclear has to find its place. If we discuss specifically towards the electricity generation, India has installed grid connected power generating capacity of 373 gigawatt, whereas the thermal power has around 231 and uh, hydro is around 45 and so on. So in 2015, the central government started vital energy reform in the name of Urja Sangam, a national energy summit, and led principles to guide energy development. Implementing, now I will come to the point that implementing these principles has not been easy. It means uh, taking complex and overlapping system of regulations. Different states have different issues. And the government of India has subsequently brought private and public sectors expert together and it established at the end that we need new thinking. Now we have to think differently and the energy transition across the energy spectrum. Our requirements are vast and robust and we will deal with this in our own way by mixing all exploitable sources of energy. Different states, as Madam Radhika has told, and Honorable Minister are also uh, told that we have to have the political will. Different states have to write their own story to energy transition with firm political will. Government likely lately have been taking strong reforms to use a gas-based economy. The blue flame, a blue flame re revolution to deliver propane cylinder to 80 million households for cooking, investment in the upstream oil and gas reforms in regulatory fiscal and price system are the policy which give new road of the energy transition. There has been push to replace natural gas for usage in the transportation instead of petrol and diesel. Also, India is becoming a major player in the global LNG market and has become a significant buyer of both oil and gas uh, LNG from the different sources, adding a significant new dimension of relation among exporting nations mainly US and Russia. Another major initiatives have been action towards converting agricultural waste in the local plant to, into biofuel and biogas and feed it into larger uh, distribution system. And with the climate change in mind, there are ambitious goal around renewables. Tariffs on solar pipe panels have been put to the strengthen. So, uh, uh, to conclude, there exists a gap in discussion over the energy transition as developed nations underplay the challenges in the developing countries and diminishing with the developing nations can call energy and need for better lives and the dirty energy. 
India is trying to make balance between the technology, innovation, emission in energy race for transition to combat the energy poverty. The policy maker has to lay clear cut road map of transition so that the confusion, there is an energy confusion which exists. Energy confusion does, does confusion does not exist, leading to creation of non-performing assets as being seen in case of the gas, gas standard power plants, solar panels, wind power, thermal power, and so on. Our country is blessed with the Surya, the sun, the wind, and the jal, the hydal energy since inception. India has been usage of this energy for growth in past during golden bird era as and have been progressive nation earlier. I think enough confusion exists in the race of energy transition and therefore we must do energy transition in our own way so that the negative balance of payment should not be generated in the country by importing different type of energy and their equipments. Let us strive for Atmanirvar in energy transition in the country for sustainability. Let us write energy transition roadmap that suits us within the broad principles of energy access to all, energy efficiency, energy security, energy sustainability, and energy justice to the mass population. Here, the role of the directors is extremely important. Directors' strategy should be to take the company into the past of, uh, path of sustainable energy transition and accordingly strategy of the company be formulated. My expectation from the dialogue would be to discuss what does energy transition could mean to India and developing nations and what sustainable approach India to follow. I am again thankful to IOD for organizing this wonderful energy transition uh, dialogue and uh, thank you very much thank you uh, now i would like to hand over further proceedings to our lady host today the other there's another radhika today the other miss radhika bachaj the very articulate professional over to radhika bachaj Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kapoor, uh, for those kind words of introduction. And uh, you have done the lion's share of the hosting today. So thank you for helping me out uh, in the assignment. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, the dialogue has been very engaging so far. And we're moving forward now with a much anticipated panel discussion, the topic for which is accelerate sustainable energy transitions, director strategy and directions in power and new and renewable energy sector. We have with us today a very, very distinguished panel with rich and varied experience in power and new and renewable energy sector. And they will be deliberating and sharing their insights, strategic perspectives and vast knowledge as we prepare for a sustainable and a bright future. It is my pleasure to first invite and introduce the moderator of this session, Mr. Jimmy Greer, Head of Sustainability, ACCA, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants UK. He creates global research and advises on policy issues for ACCA related to sustainability, social impact and business model innovations. Uh, of course, uh, we know that he is uh, the member of the UNCTADISAR Consultative Group on Enterprise Reporting on the UN Sustainable Development Goals and is also a member of the Climate Disclosure Standards Board Technical Working Group. As we know, the ACCA has been a great supporter of the Institute of Directors over several years now. We are grateful for your support, uh, Mr. Greer, and uh, grateful to have uh, ACCA also support us. Ladies and gentlemen, before I hand it over to Mr. Greer, I'd like to also introduce our speakers and uh, panelists uh, today. Uh, first, I'd like to warmly welcome Mr. Pradeep Kumar Das, Chairman and Managing Director, Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency Limited, a fellow of Institute of Cost Accountants of India, and also a member of Institute of Company Secretaries of India. He has rich and diverse experience in different capacities in many important PSUs. Uh, he has uh, contributed extensively in the formulation and implementation of various systems, new and innovative products, policies, business processes, uh, re-engineering 
uh, etc. Thank you for joining us. I'd now like to introduce and welcome uh, Mr. Vijay Karya, Chairman and Managing Director, Ravan Group of Companies, one of the fastest growing electrical businesses in Asia. It's a 70-year-old uh, global conglomerate uh, that has been at the forefront in the energy and electricity industry since 1950. The Ravan Group uh, has uh, the vision to offer the most comprehensive solutions across the electricity value chain, urban transmission systems uh, to rural electrification projects, and has played an important role in this transformation towards electricity for all. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd now like to invite our next panelist, uh, Mr. Pradeep uh, K. Kheruka, Chairman Gujarat Borosil Limited, uh, a non executive chairman Borosil Limited, and executive chairman Borosil Renewables Limited. Friends, of course, Borosil is a household name in uh, India and Asia, and now increasingly it's a globally familiar name. Mr. Kiruka is actively associated uh, with the glass industry for over 50 years. He's a strong proponent of manufacturing in India and has played a significant role in the Indian solar industry for more than a decade now since uh, its infancy. With a deep interest in manufacturing specialty glass, uh, he has led key research and development initiatives to take Borosil to the forefront in developing groundbreaking products globally. Thank you again for joining us. Next, uh, let's uh, put together our virtual applause for Mr. Suman Sinha, Chairman and Managing Director, Renew Power Limited. Mr. Sinha is a passionate advocate for solutions related to climate change through the intersection of business and public policy. He quit a successful corporate career to follow his desire of being an entrepreneur and making a contribution to climate change mitigation. As an expert on economic policy and climate change, he speaks extensively at global platforms and is sought after as a columnist and commentator. Welcome, sir. We'd also like to uh, warmly uh, uh, invite uh, Mr. Sushil Kumar Sharma, Director, Electrical uh, Satluj Jal Vidyut Nigam Limited, SJVN Limited. He has more than 30 years of rich and varied experience in various organizations, including SG, SJVN, of course. He has a vast experience in design, erection, and maintenance of hydropower plants. He has played crucial roles in the successful erection and commissioning of several hydropower stations. Thank you for joining us. I'd also like to invite uh, Mr. Sunil Jain, Chief uh, Executive Officer, Hero Future Energies Private Limited. He has over three decades of experience in automotive infrastructure and clean tech and in the manufacturing industry. He specializes in creating new markets, business lines and new businesses as well. Uh, his specialization is scaling businesses to prepare them to profitable growth and liquidity events. Thank you for joining us. Let's also finally welcome Mr. Prashant Chaube, Senior Executive Vice President, Avada Group. He carries over two decades of experience in human resources and business development, including managing strategic HR, talent engagement management, HR systems and interventions, including organizational capability building, business development, regulatory affairs, and more. Thank you very much for joining us. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a much anticipated, uh, robust panel discussion that we've been awaiting through the session. It's over to Mr. Greer. Thank you very much for all those brilliant introductions. And um, thank you very much to IOD India for having us, uh, having myself uh, here to chair this absolutely stellar panel after a real powerhouse uh, set of keynote addresses. I think you'll all agree. Um, we had the context set in so many different ways. And I, and I really don't want to repeat this. I want us to get into the panel right away. Uh, from an ACCA point of view, we're actually delighted to be working again, collaborating further on, uh, on a, uh, this super important topic related to um, uh, all, all the activities we are trying to achieve in, um, in sustainability, sustainable development and building uh, inclusive prosperity. Um, I think, you know, from my side of view, thinking about finance professionals and their interactions, we're absolutely, we have been surveying our members and they've been telling us that they absolutely want to be part of the energy transition, uh, sustainability transformations within their own organisations. And they want to assist their, uh, they've told us a message loud and clear, that they want to assist the companies that they work for in unlocking that potential, in um, helping these projects, uh, not just see light of day, but to uh, 
thrive and to become the normal. And, and you know, taking that to a global level, increasing the flow of capital across the spectrum of the energy transition is absolutely something that our members are very well equipped to do. They understand the barriers and they're ready to be supported. Um, Mr. Gruen, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. I would just uh, like to request uh, all the panelists uh, to please yes. uh, start their videos so that we can uh, see them. Absolutely. So just that request going on. Uh, please continue. Thank you very much. And uh, and I think you've reminded me right up here that I'm you know, I'm very passionate about this subject, but I think our panelists will be able to really fill us in on, on what's happening. I think maybe just to mention one more thing that I think is important for us all to bear in mind, and I think it was brought up by by um, uh, Mrs. Tawari very well, is that you know at a global level, we've got Biden's administration joining the Paris Climate Agreement. We've got very strong global commitments uh, uh, around hitting our climate goals and, and we're doing this as was mentioned around energy access around issues like air quality um what are we going to do about extreme heat coming up in the future and you know broadly tackling climate change you know, so we, we've got these big ambitions we're all signed up the policy curve is moving further faster the whole time to support and enable this to take place at a faster place the faster pace and there was I think 500 billion US dollars in the last Bloomberg report are into renewable, into the energy transition last year. This needs to be scaled up into the trillions. And I know that India will be playing a, a huge part in this, not least uh, when we see the, the absolutely fantastic commitment from um, from uh, Prime Minister Modi related to uh, SDG 7 and the generation of uh, re uh, renewable energy by uh, 2030, um, really setting that, that high level goal. And I think we've had a lot around those interactions and those, I guess, challenges along the way from so many experts. And with that, I would like to hand over to our first panelist so we can get going. I'll, I'll just ask before a little, a little bit of housekeeping for my guests. I've asked my each panelist to um, to keep their remarks to uh, to six to nine minutes, something like that. We'll then come back for a, a short discussion before going out to Q and A. So um, uh, with that, I would like to uh, welcome our first panelist. Um, Mr. Mr. Pradeep Kumar Das, uh, Chairman and Managing Director of the Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency. I hand over to you, please. <coughs> Am I audible? You are indeed. <coughs> this is the protocol we need to maintain now in the VC mode when we are talking. And to all uh, the participants and the panelists and uh, respected Sri Asok Kapoorji and uh, Institute of Directors. I'm that uh, I'm <clears throat> invited to speak on this forum, which is very relevant uh, in today's context, not only the subject, but also the organization which is organizing it, the dialogue, director's dialogue series. Actually, I got the information last Saturday, there was some communication gap perhaps. So Monday, we exchanged some uh, correspondence and today I'm participating in the discussion. So that speaks that how fast and how quick we are deciding the things. So briefly, I'll touch about uh, just uh, a minute about the industry, and then I'll straight away come to Irida and uh, comment uh, the policies what we have considered in the recent past. See, already it has been said that uh, 374 is the gigawatt uh, capacity of installation of energy, out, out of which 90 is uh, towards renewable energy, which consists 24%. And the wind is 38 and uh, solar is 37. Globally, India ranked third in terms of RE capacity, fourth in terms of <coughs> installed wind energy, and fifth in terms of solar powered installed capacity. But if you see the last five years CHER, it is 17% in last five years the industry is growing. This is RE sector. As far as self-sufficient in manufacturing is concerned, the technologies in the field of bioenergy, small hydro, wind energy, government is taking, in, already India is self-sufficient in this, and government is taking initiative to ensure to become self-sufficient in solar energy also. Now, <clears throat> Prime Minister's dream of Atmanirbhar Bharat is working in these directions, and already a already lot of, uh, uh, initiative has already been taken and uh, domestically installed capacity has been increased and many of our borrowers have also come to us earlier they used to come for projects now they have come for manufacturing of the project and if you look at uh, whenever we are doing uh, as it was said ultimate consumer in the industry is the pop 
human beings ultimately so customer is all human beings in a sense so therefore the more the population grows the more usage will be growing so simply providing them the energy is not the concept also we should enable them the employment opportunity the rough estimate is more than 5 lakh direct employment opportunity has been created in this renewable energy segment and 50 million indirect uh, bulk of jobs has also been created in this sector and mostly these jobs are 90% in semi urban and rural india if you see historically the employment is always in metro and urban india but this segment is completely changing the employment opportunity scenario and we must not forget that india is largely economy is based on rural so we need to create and generate employment opportunity in rural in order to have a ecological balance otherwise in the urban you cannot live even we are living in a place like delhi for four months we struggle to even breathe and not only because of covid we are using mask otherwise also we are using mask earlier if you talk about the uh, growth of uh, growth story of ari sector initially india was focusing mainly uh, in this uh, decentralized uh, and small hydro and with huge reduction in capital cost and cost of generation over the years we have moved from kilowatt to megawatt and megawatt to gigawatt now now this covid 19 crisis has highlighted also the importance of developing more resilient and sustainable energy system that are capable of withstanding future shocks and improving the health and well being of the citizens investment in energy was also indirectly made mandatory through the paris convention where we are mandated to gradually reduce the co2 level and in future we have to have a completely clean energy available for the society now <clears throat> to foster the energy transition government has taken various measures in the recent past permitting for my foreign direct investment because i am uh, talking the finance part particularly because uh, indian renewable energy development agency is a non banking finance company since 34 years so i'll be touching upon more into those areas so fdi of 100% of automatic route has been considered model pps and om contracts standard bidding guidelines now we are working on a unified bidding uh, guidelines i'm also a committee member there the letter of credit for security for ensuring timely payment to ari generator in place of bank guarantee that is nothing but enabling the liquidity gap mitigating the liquidity gap for the investors whoever of interested transmission system uh, i must say that this letter of credit concept was introduced by ereda only now pfc and rec they have been asked to follow this long term trajectory for renewable purchase obligations green energy corridors dedicated schemes for solarization of farm sector and agricultural farms all the factors have paved the way for several global funds who have either invested into the sector or are advanced stages of decision making now to see last 5 years roughly 9 to 10 billion has been invested in this and next 10 years we are expecting per annum around 20 billion of business opportunity in this segment now <coughs> see further uh, the challenges uh, by what covid has uh, imposed on us that business flow of ari sector was uh, has been affected due to adverse market sentiments the liquidity crisis india being one of the largest electricity demand destructions globally covid 19 caused power demand fall by 28% initially by the end of march 20 which in turn affected revenues of the discoms and this in turn has caused disruption in payment in ari generators but now again it is coming back to the track the delay in completion of project but due to the uh, disturbance in the faced by supply and chain and labor availability due to movement of issues now <clears throat> government of india also supported uh, supported the sector like time extension for completion of ari projects and uh, treating this period as a force major then moratorium period from 1st march to 31st august 
then provision of must run status for IRE. Unlike other projects where you can you can decide or you can choose to stop, but in IRE projects, generally, essentially, you have to continue. Now, relief packages of uh, 90,000 crore of Atman under Atman Bharat scheme was introduced to support the discounts. Uh, as per the latest information, this 90,000 crore has all, already increased to 130,000 crore. An emergency, emergency credit line guarantee, this is sort called ECLGS. Companies with outstanding dues of uh, 50 to 500 crore as at February 29, 2020, they're eligible to avail top up loan to the extent of 20% of the outstanding dues. So these are the measures which uh, initiated by Government of India. And IRIDA has taken uh, certain measures also that we introduce a policy of top up loan, which unlike I think our MBFC, uh, senior MBFC in government sector, RECBFC, they did not have even today. And scheme of moratorium on uh, term loans uh, for a period more than six months. And then policy framework of deferment of interest installments and shifting of repayment schedules, including residual tenure of term loans under COVID-19 scheme. And policy for guarantee emergency credit line under Atmanibha Bharat. So these are the policy IRADA has already adopted. And certain other initiatives or IRADA has also taken to remain competitive in the market. We have revised the lending rate of interest from 1st February, December 2020. Our rate of interest in the sector in energy sector, renewable energy sector is lesser than REC and PFC. Why I'm giving REC PFC reference that they are much larger in size, much more competent to raise funds at much cheaper rate in comparison to IRADA. How we are doing that? That's the mystery we should say. The company has, because this I realized that uh, having frequent borrowers interactions, the borrowers are interested in reduction in rate. So we decided that let us reduce the margin. Let us have lesser profit. So our sole object is not to make profit. Borrower satisfaction is also important. And because they were getting cheaper domestic uh, rates available in the banks, of course, that is of a very short term duration. IRADA is a for a long term kind of uh, organization. Because we raise funds, uh, funds in the market for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years line of credit from multilateral agencies. Uh, so therefore, we always look into uh, extending the uh, loan to the extent of 12 years, 15 years, or even beyond that. And company also finance for shared infrastructure park at Ramsell at 8.5% rate, which is uh, probably very, very difficult to give at a fixed rate of 20 years. So that is an infra project. So broader objective is that, that we should ensure that the infrastructure is in place so that the developer can take the benefit of it. And John, I'm openly sharing the secret here. We have hardly 0.5, 50 bips to 100 bips margin there with us. But that is a larger interest in the national interest. We have considered that. Recently, we have signed the MOU with NHPC and SJVN. I'm happy to know that our SJVN director is also here. If I'm talking something wrong, he can correct me. We have signed uh, CapEx consulting to them. Generally, they sign with Deloitte, PwC, and others. But IRIDA being a mother organization, since 34 years, it is in existence. 33 years uh, continuously making profit and giving government, as per the directive of Government of India, dividend to government also. See, but incidentally, last five years, the way um, the solar, the renewable sector has grown, particularly solar, the size of business, what is grown, probably IRIDA has not gathered that much. The basic reason is it is a 100% government of India undertaking in which the equity infusion has not happened. Prior to five years, it used to come every year. Last five years, no equity infusion has come. But with uh, uh, constant dialogue with the uh, Ministry of MNRE, DPOM, and Ministry of Finance, they have exempted for payment of a dividend from current year, in turn, indirectly infuse the equity. We have also requested them now also for 1,500 crore. We need exactly 2,000 crores of equity by which lot of multilateral agencies are ready to give us fund without any government of India guarantee. In turn, we will not be paying government of India guarantee fees, and that fees will not be loaded to our borrower. The borrowing cost by our borrowers will come down. And I'm happy that a couple of our business partners are available here. Actually, that the borrowers, I love to call them as business partners. Through them only we do business here. Now, we are planning to have uh, perpetual debt uh, the instrument raising from the market also to meet the CRA requirement of RBI. 
because the, most of our borrowers, big groups of 14, 15 borrowers, they have already reached the threshold limit. So therefore, they are not in a position. They are interested. They do not prefer to go to bank. They prefer to come here. But still, because of that threshold, we are not able to do that by infusion of equity as well as CR, uh, by raising PDI and all. We are going to enhance that CRR to larger level so that that threshold limit can be, uh, they can be enabled to uh, further lending within that. And uh, we have taken a lot, one minute only I'll take, we have taken a lot of initiatives in the last six months. If you see, it has financials, last five years, the net worth is almost stagnant. Though we are making profit, we are giving dividend. But last six months, our net worth has increased 2,000 crore. We have stopped dividend only 128 crore, but our 2,000 crore net worth has there. Sorry, 200 crore net worth has been increased. And uh, uh, the, uh, the last six months also, we have constant project review monitoring in place, which has resulted in reduction in NPA, which is very, very crucial for any NBFC. That has improved our rating in last uh, by September result also. So uh, I'm happy to share that IRIDA being a mother organization for development renewable energy in the country, because prior to SEKI, IRIDA was alone doing, it was the only extended arm of MNRE. SEKI has come just seven, eight years back. They are doing the demand aggregator load. But we being the financer, we are, financer is nothing but like oxygen to the person. It is oxygen to the project. It is main uh, ingredient after the government policy in place. We are also handholding MNRE and Ministry of Power for lot of reforms in power sector through our experience. Thank you very much. And I'll be available for questions if any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Das, for that uh, wonderful explanation. I'm sure we'll come back to many of the points, such as the green jobs you mentioned, which I thought was absolutely fantastic, and questions around affordability. I'd now like to move on to our, our next panelist, uh, Mrs. Uh, Vijay Karia, who's Chairman and Managing Director from the Rabin Group of Companies. Um, I will hand the floor over to you now, Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grief. Good evening and welcome to everybody on this conversation. I will not dwell on to the past. I will not dwell on to the problems of the energy sector, though I don't believe that it can be any longer called the energy sector. I'll come to the reasons for that. I'm here to talk about the energy transitions, the implications and opportunities for India and what it means for all of us. So I'm going to talk something on the future and what we need to do as a country. The last energy transition that happened was just over 100 years old, 100 years ago, with the entry of energy, uh, with the entry of electricity and oil. This transition has completely reshaped the global economy. Another important recent transition has been digital, which continues to reshape the global economies. The demand for data and the demand for data sovereignty is leading to a situation where apart from the daily requirements of electricity, we require a considerable amount of electricity for data, communication, business, entertainment, and for everything that we do, including our nation security, our future R&D, and all our major developments totally and wholly depend on electricity. I feel that we are on a cusp of a new energy transition where electricity shall remain a dominant status across all economies and industries. A key demand of the sustainability of the world we live in is sustainability of resources, of not polluting the world further because it cannot sustain it any longer. The global warming and the greenhouse effect are all leading to a situation where we cannot any longer afford to burn fossil fuel to generate electricity. Of course, the rising fuel costs, the pollution level, and the situation where we are creating a position where our future generations shall get badly impacted 
by our actions or inactions of today. Recently, most interestingly, in January 2021, Saudi Arabia has unveiled a plan for a zero carbon city within the projected Neom zone. The kingdom's futuristic business hub said to be built along the red coast where the city called the line will be an eco-friendly city with zero cars, zero streets and zero carbon emissions. It will have an initial capacity to house one million citizens. It will have facilities like schools, health centers and green spaces with high speed public transport system planned and pedestrian travel within the city is not expected to take more than 20 minutes. Of course, artificial intelligence plays a huge role in the venture, but most importantly, it will be 100% powered by clean energy, green energy, providing pollution free, healthier and sustainable environment for the residents. Coming to India, India has started a massive movement for addition of renewable energy from the year 2014 onwards. We moved from a total capacity of about 5 gigawatts in 2000 to a total of about 136 to 138 gigawatts today. And just the solar energy we are looking to implement in India is about 175 gigawatts by 2022. We have moved a huge transition in terms of how we generate and how we consume electricity. As one of the panelists mentioned earlier, yesterday we saw peak demand of about 186 gigawatts of electricity, though as of today, the per capita consumption of electricity in India is less than one third of the global average. In India, we have seen a massive shift in terms of generation of electricity, as I said, from thermal to renewable. And the emphasis has been on solar, where the shift has been even greater in terms of costs, where costs have reduced considerably to the extent of almost 90% and reached lower or comparable levels to most of the efficient thermal plants. We are perhaps foreseeing a future in the next decade where we might see a near zero cost of electricity where what will be paid for is the data relating to electricity and its consumption. Another transition in solar has been of tracking systems which are very popular in the US and some of the other countries but has not seen much of traction in India. The mantra of more from same and our own installation of tracking systems in India has resulted in data where we have found that we generate 35% more than a fixed state system. At the utility scale in the US, out of 29 gigawatts capacity of solar installed and these statistics are of somewhere of 2019, 21 gigawatts was with tracking system, which is almost about 70%. Whereas in India, even today, we have only about eight to 9% of the solar energy on tracking systems. Yet, despite this, our per unit costs of generation, as the Honorable Minister Sarabhai Patel said some time ago, have been sub two rupees, one rupee 99 paise to be precise. Future in tracking systems is the new consolidated design of trackers with bifocal modules to achieve the lowest LCOE. Bifocal, bifacial, sorry, bifacial solar modules that track the sun produce 35% more electricity than regular modules and can help achieve some of the lowest levelized costs of electricity in the world almost by 16%. Technology-wise, small solar trackers have optimized smart control functions with PLC and addition. Trackers for bifacial modules 
have advanced smart features like backtracking, shade control, tracking a logarithm optimized for bifacial optimization. Therefore, this is a transition that we are going to see happening very quickly in the country. In the country today, we are focused on costs, but I think this technology transition is due for implosion at any moment. There is also a transition taking place to hybrid and back battery backed systems, inherent complementary nature of wind and solar power, where wind at night and solar during the day makes a hybrid system most suited to meet the energy demand. India's wind solar hybrid capacity is expected to reach almost 11.7 gigawatts by 2023. The current hybrid system is only about 150 megawatts. Now, what India needs to quickly do to upgrade its electrical grid infrastructure, because if we keep on like this, we are seriously seeing grid integration issues at a very early, early stage once we generate more of renewable energy. The major transition that I see in terms of technologies and people have spoken about battery systems, etc. But I feel what is going to happen is fuel cells. We have the news today that the Israeli company called Store Dot has manufactured the first lithium ion battery for electrical vehicles that can charge in five minutes. If and when this comes up for commercial production will be a big welcome because it will massively shift the transition to electric vehicles from the fuel that we are using today, petrol and diesel. Thus, in our lifetime, we are seeing massive transitions taking place in our lifetime and the way the world lives in travel, in communication and in every possible way, the center of this transition is electricity. Therefore, as I said earlier, I do not believe that it is an energy transition because the word energy is being replaced by the word electricity. Therefore, whatever we say about energy, everything we are converting to electricity. And going further, I believe this transition and a key element in this transition shall be hydrogen. Hydrogen can be expected to play a major role across various sectors. Some key examples being power sector, traditional and renewables. For example, blending hydrogen with natural gas can drastically improve power generation efficiencies. Renewables combined with localized production, storage and reutilization of hydrogen with gas turbines can enable renewables to graduate from being intermittent to firm sources. Given India's major thrust towards renewables and the critical need of making this energy firm, hydrogen has the potential to emerge as a better energy storage solution for India. Industrial sector, that is oil and gas, steel, etc., are major consumers of hydrogen. Such sectors can and are producing currently hydrogen by a methane reduction process, which has a very high carbon footprint and is likely to get banned going forward. Transportation sector, we are seeing there is considerable progress made in this sector and such sectors are currently producing hydrogen by a methane reduction process, as I said, which is going to get banned further. But transportation is already using hydrogen in terms of being deployed as a fuel in select markets, specifically in Japan and to a large extent in China. Companies such as Shell, Bharat, BP, British Petroleum are modifying their petrol diesel filling stations to include hydrogen filling stations as well. Alstom, in terms of trains, has already deployed a hydrogen train and more is happening. So hydrogen is most efficiently produced by electrolysis 
and equipments and solutions needed for this will need a significant value of electrical equipment to enable this. These implications are large and will mean opportunities in trillions of US dollars on a global basis and possibly hundreds of billions of dollars in India. This energy transition will also call for new policies and financing methodologies. The developed countries are already following this. As I said, Japan is one of them. China is one of them. 88 companies in Japan, including Toyota Motor Company, have established a new organization called the Japan Hydrogen Association to promote creation of hydrogen supply chain in the country. Japan a maker of more than 5 million vehicles annually wants to have 800,000 fuel cell vehicles sold from around 3,400 currently. So thus, the countries that are moving towards this technology on a first mover basis will be massively benefited. India therefore needs to quickly get onto this bus and move rapidly. We thus welcome this initiative by IOD to bring in a focused discussion to ignite and accelerate the various strategic discussions being held across the boardrooms. And we are happy and proud to be part of it. I do wish that more such discussions take place so that we can rapidly move towards a better, a greener and a cleaner world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those uh, very uh, visionary and practical remarks, Mr. Kuriger. I, I thought that was a fantastic view on the, what is happening now. It's really, it's really happening now. So the time is, time is of the essence. Um, just on, uh, as you mentioned, the electricity uh, transition. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic. To all those different examples coming through. So thank, you, thank you very much. Um, and, and now let's move on to our next uh, speaker, Mr. Pradeep Kuriger. He's a uh, chairman of Borosil, non-exec chairman of Borosil, and exec chairman of Borosil Renewables. Um, so um, delighted to have you with us. Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, compliment the Institute of Directors for having set up this uh, webinar. The kind of uh, policy initiatives that we've heard uh, really uh, is, is so interesting that uh, it's, it's truly a very large enterprise trying to bring renewable energy and uh, uh, integrating it into the overall policy uh, power grid of the nation. Um, I would say that the enormous amount of work that has been done by the government already has resulted in a rapid expansion of demand uh, for domestic production. And we see that in the last few years, uh, production of uh, solar modules has been rising rapidly. And that's all thanks to government policies uh, for which uh, I'm grateful. Um, we, this has enabled us to expand our own production uh, from uh, 180 tons per day to about 450 tons a day, or the, uh, translated into, uh, in, into units of energy that would be from one gigawatt to 2.5 gigawatts worth of glass for uh, uh, manufacturing of uh, solar modules. The only question that we need to ask ourselves is, why is it that we have not had a flood of people, new investors coming in to set up production in India of uh, the different components that go into the production of a solar module? And the answer clearly lies in the fact that uh, the production in China especially uh, is subsidized and incentivized. And uh, with this, it has caused a migration of production away from other countries of the world and into China, I can speak with some knowledge about the field of solar glass, for instance. Now, the first solar glass was made in the world in the United States by a company called AFT then, which later was acquired by Asahi. And um, so we have world leaders like Asahi, Saint Gobain, Guardian, Pilkington, uh, all of whom were manufacturing solar glass at some point and all of whom have withdrawn now from this, uh, from this field. And the reason is, again, because uh, there has been a lot of competition from China, which has been selling on prices which are lower than the cost, and the, the, this stands proved. 
So if we are to succeed with Atma Nirbhar Bharat or Self-Reliant India, it's very important that the concerned ministries go delve into this and understand what exactly the problems are that are being faced by the by by the uh, by Indian producers, and uh, we should then request them uh, to to prepare certain things that uh, are uh, uh, to, 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 that allow uh, manufacturers to set up shop and and increase the number of players in the field. Um, so. I would say that there are other there are other impediments uh, which are standing in the way. For instance, uh, we are getting power at eight rupees fifty paisa, which is uh, very well known. Uh, it's, it's very well known across the board. Uh, solar glass is actually tempered low iron glass. Uh, all of tempering is uh, is electricity. So tempered glass is nothing but electricity for which we pay twice as much as any other country. As any other producer in any other country, and for that, uh, we are really not able to find a solution to bring or to allow uh, people like us to obtain power at the right price. Uh, we can, we when when we buy from power trading houses, all kinds of charges and levies are put on that. So at the at the end of it, we might perhaps get only fifty paisa or half a rupee less than the than the price that we are paying to the grid, and. Uh, uh, the, all this points to a bit of a uh, a bit of a disconnect between what the Ministry of Power wishes to do and what the Ministry of Renewable Energy wishes to do, because the Ministry of Power is obviously committed to the producers of fossil fuel power, uh, which will sustain the grid. Uh, they, they are holding up the grid, and uh, whereas the Ministry of Renewable Energy is clearly trying to bring renewable energy into the into the field. And uh, if today we wish to set up uh, our own energy farms, which could give us net metering, uh, the, we we are first of all not permitted. And uh, when we are not permitted, and there's a cap put on the amount of power that we may that we may generate from renewable sources, then that puts a spoke in the wheel of uh, being able to implement renewable energy with greater force than what is happening. For example, if we were to install renewable energy, we would not seek any viable viability gap funding or anything of that sort. We just need permission. That's all. Uh, there is a gentleman who I know personally. It's Dr. Winfred Hoffman. He is a German national. Uh, he has been awarded so many stars that you could uh, you could make a constellation out of all the stars that he's been awarded by the European Union. Uh, he understands how to integrate uh, renewable power with grid power, with fossil fuel power. And uh, I would be very happy to to sponsor his his meeting with the concerned people in the ministry, if required, and uh, uh, at least hear from him what he has to say. How has Europe solved uh, this crisis, this problem of being able to uh, blend renewable power with with uh, grid power, and uh, hopefully find a solution to the cost of power that we must pay in order to make our product. For the Indian market, or for the world market, for that matter. Uh, having said this, I would also like to say that I am pleased to say that uh, in a recent uh, capacity expansion that we have planned, we were able to secure interest by a uh, lot of uh, international private equity firms. And I, to my knowledge, this is the first time uh, that private equity has invested in a company, in an Indian company, which is manufacturing products. Which are components for assembly of uh, photovoltaic modules. Uh, so I hope that this is a welcome portent, and this will be accelerated if the government is able to look more uh, at the solar components which need to be made in India beyond merely cells and modules. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks, there, Mr. Kruger, and it's absolutely fantastic to hear from. Uh, your expertise around that manufacturing side, uh, which uh, and to hear your experiences. There. So thank you so much. We'll sort of pick that up some more in our discussion later. I'd now like to move on to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Sunan Simran, who's chairman and managing director from the New Power Limited. Um, and I guess without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Mr. Simran. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Uh, I'm not sure if my camera is on yet, but I'm nevertheless going to start and I'm sure the camera will find its way uh, to becoming on at some point. Um, okay, look, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's, a, it's obviously a pleasure to be here and to listen to all my distinguished uh, colleagues and panelists uh, on this call. Um, you know, obviously, this is a topic that uh, has been discussed uh, at length uh, in various forums. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very important topic, and I think therefore it's important for us to continue to make sure that we discuss it and, and continue to disseminate the issues uh, that are involved. Um, sustainability is obviously a very important issue, right? And um, we have to make sure that, um, um, you know, whatever can be done to address it uh, from the point of view of not just companies in our sector, in the renewable energy sector, but companies more broadly, uh, are able to uh, uh, deal with it uh, and do whatever they can because ultimately companies um, will be um, you know the companies are in fact uh, I would say one of the biggest emitters of carbon and therefore the steps that companies can take will have a big implication on uh, the issue of uh, sustainability um, and carbon emission so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that uh, we, uh, you know, uh, as corporates do our best to address this issue. Yeah, thank God my camera is finally on. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, just this, the, our sector, the renewable energy sector, electricity, uh, energy, et cetera, you know, we talk about renewable uh, energy, but in actual fact, we're talking about renewable electricity because so far electricity is really where we've been uh, operating um, as renewable energy companies, and that's really where the thrust so far has been. But in actual fact, electricity represents um, only a, a third of the total energy that we uh, use uh, in the world right now. And so therefore, while of course we have to deepen the area of, um, or, or green the electrification that we have currently uh, through more renewable energy, we equally need to extend the amount of electrification that we have in the energy basket as a whole. Uh, and if you look at carbon emissions globally, let's say if carbon emissions are uh, 100, uh, 75 of that comes from the energy sector. And of that, 25 comes from electricity. So we have to increase the amount of uh, renewable energy in that 25 and then increase the 25 to as big a percentage as we can. And fortunately, that is happening because other sectors are getting uh, electrified more and more. And also with electricity, we, of course, renewable energy is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. So if we just sort of look at the or cascade down uh, these issues a little bit, and I'll first talk about the issue of greening of electrification, which is really uh, asking for more renewable energy penetration. That is something that is well on its way. I think till three, four years ago, perhaps there could, be a, there could have been a lot of cynics and skeptics who could have said renewable energy has to be subsidized, it's expensive, et cetera. But I think that is now well past us or well behind us. We all know that renewables is the cheapest form of new electricity and uh, governments recognize that, policymakers recognize that, markets recognize that, and therefore we will have more and more renewables. And as we look at the future, it is actually incredible to see the kind of growth that may happen in our sector. Uh, you know, today globally renewables is only a thousand gigawatts of the total 6,000 gigawatts of installed uh, capacity of the power sector. So it's about a sixth in terms of, of generation, sorry, in terms of capacity and much less in terms of generation. Now, as we look at the next 30 to 40 years, as all, you know, as various countries start trying to move towards a, emissions reductions, this 1,000 gigawatt number of renewables today is going to grow by 10 or 15 times. And so therefore it's gonna be a, a massive opportunity for all of us operating in the sector. Uh, it's gonna require capital. It's gonna require a lot of technology solutions to show up. It's going to lead to a lot of job creation. So everything everything clearly very positive, right? So I think uh, it's something that we should all be looking forward to and continue to invest in and so on. Uh, and I'll come to what the implications are for India in a second. Um, and the second of course aspect is that as we look forward, there are various sectors, which are these hard to abate sectors that have to get electrified. The whole area of transportation or mobility has to get electrified. And that also will happen as we have more technology evolution happening in those sectors. And so therefore, again, that will be positive in terms of carbon emissions reductions. Now, how what the implications are for India is the following. Uh, number one, 
we have uh, uh, obviously are going to have a massive requirement of capital because we will require almost um, half a trillion dollars to be invested in the renewable energy sector over the next 10 years, which means $50 billion every year, uh, compared to our current investments of $10 billion every year. So this number has to be scaled up by several times on an average basis over the next 10 years. So the question is, where is this capital going to come from? Uh, now, there, I think the view is that there is enough capital globally that if uh, that if uh, that capital senses that they can get good, decent returns in this sector, that capital will come in. So I think the important thing is for the government to be able to be able to provide a predictable uh, regime where returns are reasonable. They don't have to be humongous. They have to be reasonable. So I think that is very important. The second thing that we require is we need um, predictable policies, policies you know, around things like ISTS, waiver, will that continue post uh, 2023 June? In what form will it continue? You know, bids that happen, that power needs to be sold uh, to end customers. You can't have situations where bids happen and then finally nothing happens to those bids. Uh, you need to have a clear system about open access, which is not that clear right now. Uh, so I think those kinds of issues have to be addressed very clearly. Um, the other thing that is going to be very important is the reform of the power sector as a whole. Uh, you know, ultimately, renewable energy is operating within the context of an overall power sector. And if that power sector itself suffers from deficiencies, as we know that it does, then obviously that will go to, that will that will stymie the growth of the renewable energy sector as well. And within that, you know, we all know that the biggest issue is the area of distribution company reforms. Uh, unless the distribution companies are reformed, we will not be able to grow renewable energy substantially. And so that is a very, very big area. Uh, now, within that, of course, we all know that, uh, you know, there are regulators who are perhaps not as independent as they need to be. We have uh, political pricing of power, uh, electricity that is harming the whole sector. So that whole area needs to be reformed. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and uh, I think that is an area that, uh, you know, uh, passes on a lot of stress onto everybody else in the sector. So I think that's uh, the second big thing that needs to be looked at. And the third, of course, is that we need more companies to operate in the sector and to make investments, acquire land, do all the execution on the ground, which is itself going to be a mammoth task. So I think, look, India is well on its way to achieving the targets that we've set out, which are very ambitious. Uh, we have a number, we have a fairly mature sector now that is operating. Uh, where there is enough of an ecosystem of players and capital providers. So from an execution standpoint, I think the challenge can be met. Um, I talked about some of the regulatory reforms that are still work in progress that need to be done, without which this target will not be met. So I think that is very critical. And uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, there will be, as I said earlier, a tremendous amount of job creation that happens. Manufacturing is an area that the government has clearly identified as being an area of focus for further investments. So hopefully we become self-reliant in manufacturing as well, and that would be very positive uh, for the country. So I think in all of those areas, in all of those mechanisms, I think renewable energy as a sector can be a very big growth opportunity and will certainly be the largest part of the infrastructure sector uh, in the near future. Uh, there will be a lot of changes, a lot of technology evolutions and so on. So I think uh, uh, we have something very interesting to look forward to, but I think broadly companies across all sectors have a role to play. All companies have to uh, do whatever they can for sustainability and so on. So let me stop here because I know we're running out of time and I've taken a fair bit of yours. Thanks a lot. No, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Senna. And I think that was absolutely fantastic. You know, where's the capital coming from and that call, not just the regulatory side and uh, policy uh, stability, but also the new entrants. Come on, this is a, you know, this is a kind of rallying call that we want to hear across, uh, across the sector, uh, attracting people in and getting others to get involved as well. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, and, um, and you're uh, being concise as well. I really appreciate that from all of our speakers, actually. Um, so on to um, our next speaker, uh, Mr. Sushil uh, Sharma from SJVN. Um, I'm gonna hand the floor over to you, Mr. Singh. Uh, sorry, Mr. Sharma, please. Am I audible? Hello, yes, you are audible, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm very uh, thankful to uh, IOD for giving me the opportunity for expressing my views on the topic accelerating sustaining uh, sustainable energy transitions. 
As we know, uh, India is a signatory to the Paris Agreement of December 2015, which has set a goal of limiting global uh, global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius compared to the pre uh, industry levels. Also, the signatory countries will pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This will require a major push towards the zero emission in the coming decades. Uh, I would also like to mention that in the recent five years, 2014 to 15, 19, have been the warmest years of Mother Earth and the climate crisis is staring at us and we have to do a lot to accelerate the transition at a faster rate. It is a hard fact that we are already into a position where climate change is, uh, climate is changing and uh, we have only few decades to save our environment beyond irre irreparable and irreversible loss. Uh, with regard to India, India, India submitted its NDC in 2015 for implementation of the Paris Agreement in the post-2020 period. The NDC has eight goals, including three quantitative goals, namely a reduction in the emissions intensity of gross domestic product by 33 to 35 percent by 2030 from 2005 level, achieving about 40 percent cumulative uh, electric power installed capacity from non-fossil fuel based uh, energy sources by 2030 and creating an additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, through additional forest and tree cover by 2030. India, uh, India as a developing country has a huge task to transform the energy requirements from fossil fuel to zero emission based energy. On the one, on the one side, India has to accelerate the growth of economy and on the other hand, manage the energy requirements. India's, we know, uh, Mr. Sharma, we, we know my apologies to interrupt you, Mr. Sharma. Can we request you to please uh, switch on your camera so we can see you? Sir? I'm, I'm trying, ma'am. Ma I'm trying to uh, click on the uh, video, but it's not coming. Uh, all right, in that case, sir. Thank you. Okay. Please I'll, I'll Sorry try. for the I'll interruption. I'll try. I'll try. I'll try again. Try, but it's not coming. Yes, just a minute. It's not coming, ma'am. <laughs> uh, no problem at all, sir. Please continue. Uh, I, think, I think it, it has. Uh, yes, it, we it can see you. Yeah, Bingo. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I was telling that uh, India's per capita consumption of electricity cities in, uh, uh, is uh, 1,209 units in the year 1920, whereas the per capita in uh, consumption of world is more than 3,000 units. And uh, we know that consumption of electricity is, is a significant parameter of the standard of living. Therefore, India has to increase the consumption of electricity manifold to move up on this parameter. And the major contributor, I think, in the coming decades shall be the RES, RES renew, renewable energy sources. Uh, our company, SJVN, at present has a portfolio of more than 8,000 megawatt, comprising of uh, uh, hydro, mainly hydro, and uh, renewable, and uh, trans, uh, this uh, thermal and transmission. Uh, SGVN also has a, uh, already has a presence in the RE sector. Recently, uh, we we won 100 megawatt uh, uh, megawatt solar power, uh, solar project in Dholera in Gujarat uh, on stiff competition uh, from uh, uh, all over India. Uh, so regarding this, uh, accelerating the growth, uh, the, accelerating the transitions, we have to have a multi pronged strat strategies and solutions. Uh, we also need to bring the technology and government policies together to achieve our goal. This is my uh, point of view. With reference to energy, I can say that uh, 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 with reference to technology of this energy transmission, I can say that we have sufficient technology available at present to increase the presence of solar and wind. But we have a challenge, a small challenge to store the electricity generated from solar and wind. And for that, also the technology like lithium ion batteries are available but only constraint is their production and availability. But I am sure that in the coming three to four years, the availability of battery storage will be enough to meet our demand. But uh, uh, while we are dis discussing the accelerating measures, we I think we should also ponder upon what are the barriers also. The major uh, barrier, I think, is the social economical barrier uh, from, uh, uh, from shifting the coal-based, coal and oil-based, uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, fuel to uh, this uh, renewable energy sources. We know that coal is a cheap fuel and a lot of industries and population is dependent upon coal for their livelihood. Similarly, the case for oil. By moving from fossil fuel to RES, a lot of jobs will be lost and other 
and will be the other impacts also. So we have to manage that change. I think this is a big challenge. Uh, again, I also think uh, RES has uh, some uh, this uh, changing this uh, uh, transition has also some barriers uh, for some industries like airline and shipping, which uh, consumes a lot of fossil fuel, but we have to find uh, solutions for uh, in future for such industries. Uh, with reference to Indian scenario, uh, I, I'm, I have uh, three, uh, three uh, solutions that are most suitable for uh, countries like India and developing countries. Uh, the first, I think, first uh, uh, the solution is systematic energy management. Uh, although the center and the state governments are doing a lot of lot to promote the RES, but I think the most important way to accelerate the energy transition is to do the work at the local level. Uh, what we require is energy management uh, at the district level or at the village level. We have to plan and make a systematic, systematic energy management system for, uh, for, uh, uh, for state, for district and village. Uh, uh, by managing energy at a local, a local level, uh, we can certainly accelerate the transition to renewable energy. By local energy management system, I mean to produce the electricity locally and to consume the electricity locally. We can compare this mechanism with any other produce which is managed locally, for example, this agriculture and food products which are produced locally and consumed locally. To strengthen my viewpoint, I can refer a few success, local success stories in energy management. Uh, I want to specifically quote an example of uh, Panchayat Odenthuray. It, it, it comprises of a small hamlet of 11 vill uh, villages. Uh, it is 40 kilometers from uh, Coimbatore in, uh, in the state of Tamil Nadu. Some, year, some years ago, it was just like an ordinary village. There were hardly any pakka house and there were no uh, sufficient resources in the village for development. But sometime back, this village started implementing integrated wind and solar plant. Initially, they installed solar panels in every household, which reduced their energy bills. And uh, also, uh, they were able to have electricity in their houses. Uh, subsequently, by taking loans from bank, they installed a windmill and also installed solar panels on the spare land. By doing all these integrations of wind and solar, now, nowadays, Udanthurai uh, Panchayat produces 7 lakhs units of electricity, out of which 4.5 lakhs of uh, units are consumed locally, and they also sell spare 2.5 lakhs of power to Tamil Nadu Electricity Board at a rate of 3. Point, uh, uh, 3. Point, uh, rupees 3.0 unit. That way, they generate a cash cash of rupees 19 lakhs per month after uh, repaying the loans, etc. Similarly, uh, and this uh, seven, 19 lakhs of rupees they spend on the improvement of development of uh, development activities in their villages. Similarly, Chikbalapur district of Karnataka has 5,500 clean cook stoves through use of biogas. We have a uh, we have a lot of uh, success stories like like uh, like these above uh, two villages in in India. Uh, similarly, we often hear uh, success stories in other countries such as some town in uh, UK or USA have totally switched over to renewable energy uh, resources by uh, employing wind and solar energy solutions. In the integrated plan, we can also include other things such as solar pumps, uh, solar pumps, etc. at the local level. One more advantage of local energy management system is that we do not need miles and miles of transmission lines. In India, where still a lot of people have limited access to electricity, the energy management at local level will transform their life, lives. The local management of energy will also help stabilizing the grid. Therefore, we need to have an energy management plan for every district and village to accelerate the transition in a uh, in a very cost uh, effective solution. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, in my viewpoint, is a uh, if we implement this uh, local energy management plan. It will certainly transform, transform and accelerate the transition to renewable energy sources. Now, second, my uh, solution is to further promote the hydro sector. Uh, regarding uh, this uh, renewable energy sources, I want to state that we also need to be cautious 
that while managing the climate change, we may not change the environment. We know that solar modules and batteries have a limited life for 20 to 25 years. So after 20 to 25 years, we have to face a disposal of these panels and batteries, which if not dealt properly, will, properly will do a lot of environmental damage. At this juncture, I would I want to stress that side by side, we should also promote and encourage hydro sector, hydro power plants. Hydro power plants produce almost clean energy. The hydro power of the society has to not many years. There are hydro power plants in India which, which are more than 50 years old and are still doing well. Another advantage of uh, hydro plant is that although the cost of power is high in the initial years, but say after 15 to 20 years, the cost of hydro energy comes down dramatically after repaying the loan, etc. In India, we know that there is a scope of about 90 uh, gigawatt of hydro potential. Until now, we have only harnessed half of that potential. By promoting hydro plants, we will have a long-term solution of sustainable clean energy. Similarly, in India, we have a lot of potential in the pump storage plants, which are also a clean source of energy. Energy, sorry. And the third uh, solution I want to uh, say is that uh, we should also invest in new technologies uh, in the long run, such as hydrogen uh, fuel cells or other uh, technology which emission which have zero emissions. For uh, medium to long term solutions, say after uh, uh, 2040, 2050, we we also uh, we, we have to need we have to develop new technologies like these hydrogen fuels or some other uh, technology so that uh, this technology with almost zero emissions uh, meet the, our environmental uh, uh, this targets and uh, this challenge. Uh, our company at uh, our SJVN will be happy to associate with any such energy technologies to sustain the environment. Uh, so uh, I will not say much on, uh, on this, uh, uh, this topic because uh, there are still a lot of uh, uh, speakers on the meeting. So, to so conclude my point of view, I want to emphasize that to accelerate, accelerate the transition of energy, we have to go for energy management at the local level by promoting uh, this uh, by uh, local level and by promoting hydro and uh, to have uh, more uh, new technologies. Uh, we have to make more successful stories like Udan Thuri and Chikbalapu. So with the, these uh, words, I uh, complete my uh, this, uh, views and uh, my speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma, and thank you so much for bringing that perspective and really uh, setting out the case for that sort of that local uh, management and the, the efficiencies therein and the kind of exponential efficiencies in a sense. Um, absolutely brilliant. So thank you, thank you so much. I'm sure that Sonny will come back to as well. I'm now on to move on to our, our next panelist, Mr. Sunil Jain. He's a Chief Executive Officer of Hero Future Energies. And um, he is going to be our next speaker coming up soon. I'm going to hand over the floor to, to you, Mr. Jain. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I hope the fatigue has not set in for too much of sustainability discussions. You know, so what I would be speaking is I won't go into too much of data and numbers of what India has done or what others have done. But I'm going to talk about a broader picture. First, on a country levels, we must all realize that it has taken, you know, years of cross-governmental negotiations to arrive at that Paris Climate Change Agreement. No doubt, a great breakthrough was achieved to have a low carbon planet and economies around the world. But it is also a fact that all the targets agreed by various countries, majority of them have been missed and not by one, but many of them. But it is also a fact that post that agreement, the deployment of renewables for a transition to a more cleaner energy definitely took place. India is a large economy with large industrialization and with the focus of the current government 
to supply 24 into 7 power to the 1.4 billion people of the country is a humongous task. And we believe that renewables, even though being deployed in large numbers, cannot fulfill that ambition of the government, which is another part of a sustainable development goal, where you provide a minimum electricity to the have-nots of this world. So, with India's energy basket comprising mainly of oil and gas, coal-based power, and now a portion of it, even if it is 10% renewables. The fact is that if India has to transit, or for that matter, the entire development world has to transit into renewables, the availability of the capital, which my earlier panelist, even Suman Sinha mentioned, has to come from somewhere. The underdevelopment countries cannot have that kind of capital available. And unfortunately, some of these underdeveloped countries or developing nations, whatever you may want to call them, or the emerging economies, name can be anything, they are struggling on two fronts, providing a livelihoods to the large populations and at the same time trying to deploy capital for climate change mitigations. But that capital ultimately has to come from developed countries, which I believe still remains a distance dream. It is coming, but it fits and starts. It's not enough to really revolutionize the deployment of renewables across the world. Now, therefore, what do we do? We need a sustainable development. And the need of the R, therefore, is the corporates of this world have to step in. For India, we have seen that there are corporate rules and regulations, the board levels, there have been audit committees, there have been NRC committees, there is now even subcommittees for CSR. But is there any board level sustainable development committee for the corporate? Do we have one? Do we, do the corporates have a board level vision and a statement of purpose for each of their investment where they believe that wherever they invest, it will have a sustainable development goal in mind under the UN Charter. We all know that trillions of dollars are invested by corporates all around the world year on years. But if that capital is deployed with this goal in mind, probably we would have won half the battle. I think so too, it is important for all of us that we take a step and decide what the corporates have to do in that sense. Therefore, the need of the R is that corporates must step in in a big way to make this sustainable development goals a reality. We must understand that we have only one planet and climate change impacts are more visible, more impactful, more vicious than ever before. <clears throat> in India alone, we have seen the extreme temperatures sitting here in Delhi. And therefore, one pandemic taught us that if you stay indoors, your air will be far more cleaner. Why we focus on transition to renewables and energy is because on a Pareto chart, energy accounts for the maximum carbon emissions. And therefore, you always try to focus on that one big elephant in the room to see that if you can remove that, probably you will have far more cleaner planet to live on. Another point which I want to make is while this transition from fossil fuel to non-fossil fuel is happening fast and furious, you would have almost 180 gigawatt of solar energy deployed every year, year on year for next five years, maybe more. And almost 70 to 80 or maybe even 100 gigawatts of wind energy deployed. We must also understand that this energy is not going to be firm and predictable energy, even though technology is coming and playing its role in the, at least forecasting it more accurately. The fact is you would need 
another form of technology like battery storage, hydrogen, or hydro to make this power firm and make this realistic for utilities to totally transit from fossil to non-fossil. I think so hydro has not got the place where it should have got in development and hydro is one more important point is that a hydro project is life is can be 50 years 60 years and that makes the difference unlike a hydrogen plant or a battery storage plant where the lives could be much short lived and therefore it become bring me to another question that while this transition is happening is this sustainable is it sustainable in the long run let me look at it i have done a calculation that by 2035 and 2040 this world would have 400 million solar panels to be disposed of or recycled and where are we today do we even have a policy plans technology how we want to recycle them or is it that in order to recycle or dispose them off we'll create another crisis of climate change what we have today so in india at least we believe in karma we believe in life after death so at least india can take a lead in this matter to see that the true sustainable development on the renewable sector would be that how we reuse recycle and redeploy all the material what we are using today in trying to fight this climate change from fossil fuel transition to non-fossil fuel transition which is true also for wind turbines so that is one message and therefore the governments around the world have to wake up and decide how a new policy a new framework has to come on this recycling and read disposable of all this material which is going to be lying on hundreds and hundreds of hectares of land across the world and now including on the ponds and the rivers when you do floating solo and so on and so forth so by this and including battery battery deploy mm, disposal is going to be even far greater challenge although it is easily recyclable but then the quantum is going to be huge so my message is the boards of the country of the companies have to start following a dictate on the board of what their vision and what their purpose of existence is and how they will contribute to the well-being of the planet and secondly are we doing it in a true sustainable way thank you thank you so much mr jane and i think your your call for boards actually to really really think about that transformation piece uh, not just about that uh it's not just about the the investment and the capital but actually when you those just those two areas remanufacture re uh rethinking materials i mean this is a, such a huge leadership space um but clearly all of those questions we've been discussing today are equally applicable to that we can't have an end of life for this there is no end of life for, for what we're for what's being proposed so thank you so much i'm sure this will come up in our discussion and i'm going to move on to our last speaker Mr. Prashant Chalbi, um, you're Senior Executive Vice President from the Avada Group. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, hand the floor over to you now um, as our final uh, panelist. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. You are thank audible. you so much. Uh, good evening, all. And uh, thank you, Institute of Directors, for this wonderful opportunity for discussions on uh, such a relevant uh, issue today, which is, in fact, a watershed moment for us today. Uh, this eminent panel uh, today has truly elucidated uh, agenda so well and being last speaker uh, uh, to fulfill the shoes of uh, stalwarts of the Indian renewable sector is, is difficult and a tough task for me, but yet made simpler because of the thought provoking addresses. So let me try humbly. Uh, I'll just focus on the a lot of uh, relevant issues have already been covered. I'll just focus on what does energy transition really mean for us today? And what are the trends there that will shape the journey forward? I think it's not only about uh, decarbonizing efforts and reducing uh, uh, dependence on fossil fuels. It also means ensuring cheap, quality, 
and and reliable power to urban and rural to industries and poor it also means wider deployment of uh, renewable with harmonious integration with the grid that's going to be a major issue it means a larger adoption of electric mobility so what i feel is that the energy transition we are talking about it may create a lot of disruptions but at the same time they are going to throw a humongous opportunity for for a new and more uh, sustainable and innovative business models i recall uh, john f kennedy once observed that the word crisis in chinese is composed of two characters one representing danger and other opportunity i think without going into linguistic i think the sentiment is very enough today india which is running uh, uh, one of the largest clean energy program in the world today with a target of about 450 uh, gigawatt of a renewable power by 2030 which would represent almost like a 55% of a plant capacity now this transition has an enormous uh, implication given that we already had about uh, 380 gigawatt of installed capacity our needs are growing our our energy demand will roughly dip, roughly double by uh, 2050 but still we we are dependent at about two third level while this electricity is still generated from the fossil fuels i think we have seen the trend the trend is moving from uh, from a normal uh, uh, vanilla solar and wind winds to a hybrid to the peak time storage to the thermal to the rtc because eventually we need to understand is a requirement of a distribution company is a requirement of a of a consumer which is about dispatchable power so that is what will save this transition forward i think we have seen the uh, impact of a, of of a pandemic which has uh, shook the entire globe the 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 2020 as such was a not great year for the indian solar sector which was uh, uh, affected by by pandemic what i am trying to bring is that that pandemic which is which has slowed down the development activity the which has brought down the ongoing projects to a grinding halt which has really shaken the solar supply chains which is uh, which has led uh, uh, almost like uh, bringing economy to the stand still that episode is also a part of this transition right and we need to keep this in mind i think Uh, this year the renewables are expected to come back uh, the, the the delayed projects are going to pick up but this pandemic has has economic uh, ramification including for sustainability including for for energy transition and in india this means that any cost reducing proposition is a smart alternative for us so renewable energy which is at the cusp of this opportunity because it delivers cheaper cleaner electricity and with inverted commas right regulatory and policy framework i think is going to be a way forward more more affordable less polluting decentralized renewable system with storage they are the solutions for for uh, uninterrupted power to india's industry urban center remote and rural areas uh, to electrify schools health center small businesses i think we india has become a, a one of a, a top leader in, in most attractive renewable market today but what will be needed to sustain this transition one would be continued measures and a very long term reform for sustainability resilience and efficiency of a sector that is very important ease of doing business would need to be focused on there'll be a wider adoption of renewables so you need to have a supporting ecosystem along with the grid robustness you need to probably look more on increasing uh, role of a public private partnership and also uh, a need of a finance which my uh, fellow panelists have uh, uh, so eminently pointed out that's going to be a, a real cues for us uh, so journey is difficult uh, uh, we have learned from covid that the crisis of such a proportion we can't handle with the same instrument of governance i think we need to look there have been a persistent issues with the industry is still facing there have been a request for genuine extensions there are uh, issues with uh, payment delays by discoms there have been issues related to subsidy gst and hgd reimbursement which are still pending for a while uh the curtailment is still an issue and ultimately the focus need to be on uniform power sector laws across the states of india that affect banking that affect net metering that affect open access regulation that affect single window clearance that affect fast dispute resolution so coming back the the, the sustainable energy trends to mind that can be turned into growth opportunities today will will be a larger deployment of renewable a uh, uh, grid connected uh, distributed generation probably green and hydrogen probably fuel cells and gradually the use of utility scale uh, energy storage is also going to be a future plus digitalization of the grid so i think that is going to be a very very important aspect for us on a technology front storage is crucial 
is is the underutilized piece for, for the growth of uh, energy renewable energy today and i think the most robust enforcement of probably rpos uh, mechanism in achieving rtc power will will give it a lot of push uh, our, our our journey towards self reliance which is through atmanirbhar bharat route it will also need a bit of a tweaking and reorientation i think india with such a humongous plan for for deployment of renewable we are still dependent on on critical raw materials like modules energy and all those things and energy sustainability and security needs robust capability which probably we do have for a project deployment but we yet still still uh, need to have that for our manufacturing capability so that is very very important one important aspect i like to pay attention here which uh, uh, play a very important role in the entire energy segment is, is is the role of a open access in india i think uh, 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 high paying uh, consumer and uh, uh, industrial consumers they are about uh, 50% of a total electricity consume consume in, in india they are the part of that and i think a favorable regime with uh, uh, with uh, more standardization of a policy a uniform guidelines a more clarity on a long term stability that is gonna be a cue uh, 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 my fellow panelists also talked about one sun one world and one grid concept this very important because that will serve to set the tone and imperative for a very strong uh, transmission and distribution system which can support so much of in plus of our renewable energy that is going to be a paradigm for us so uh, as our uh, honorable prime minister has, has has emphasized that india will not be able to fully use its solar power potential unless we develop better solar panel battery storage and manufacturing capabilities i think this year onwards is going to be a real time for a transition for our sustainability agenda and how we manage all these issues i think that is going to uh, set the tone for sustainable energy transition thank you very much for your time and thank you very much uh, institute of directors for this opportunity today thank you thank you very much for those uh, great comments mr shadri and I, i really appreciate that uh, that summing up that you did at the end there and um, i think we, i'm going to now just i think we're going to go over just a little bit just to take two or three questions and i'll take them in a group i'll take them i'll put them to the panel uh, in a group really for them to come in and um, and um, and but before i do i just want to say to everyone um you know we as acca welcome um iod colleagues to um our uh, uh, the coming summit in london in glasgow in uh, in november the cop26 mm-hmm. we're planning a huge program of work around it along with many others um our governments and and many others and the finance sector completely mobilized towards that goal and i'd welcome everyone to join us either in person or probably virtually um as as is will be the case um to participate in activities towards cop26 a huge moment for um the the world as we come out of this uh hopefully come out of this this period of uh crisis um just so on these three topic areas i just want i just if i can just go back to the panel really i'm just going to summarize i think there's three areas coming through here um from our questions from the audience and some of the other sort of things that have come up today one is around capital um um some of the questions coming in about how can we support smaller investors to become involved in this and provide them with that kind of uh i guess security ar- around engagement in um in supporting energy transitions or electricity transitions as some some uh some have called it on the panel so one is around capital what would be the one big thing that you would like to see to to support the um the flow of capital um into those different sectors uh, what are, what are one of those barriers that you'd like to see unlocked I think another one is on um is on innovation. Um that you know we we had a little bit there around um around the kind of uh moving to digital around the grid and and how can we sort of grow the uh innovation ecosystem around the, around the transition. Uh what are those kind of key levers and what are the kind of things that you're seeing that will take us to you know a different type of uh uh innovation ecosystem over the next 5 to 10 years. And I guess the final one is sort of linked to that which is around that um that local picture which I think was mentioned by a few as well a few people as well about local generation um and perhaps um there's a specific question on microgrids for example and the potential of microgrids within there which I guess links in again to a technology question as well but in those sort of three areas of capital uh, innovation um and uh, i guess technology and that local level w- would anyone like to come in with any points maybe to remark on what their colleagues have heard uh what they've been hearing from their colleagues and in response to that 
Um, be really grateful for any input from the panel. I, I see, um, Mr. Kumar, you, you've got your uh, your camera on, and uh, be grateful if you if you wanted to kick off um, with with any comments from your side. That would be it. Brilliant. It's asking me. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Das. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. And uh, see, uh, as far as capital is concerned, I don't think we have any problem with respect to that. If you see the banking system today are having enough liquidity in the market, as a result, the uh, interest rate has gone down in the banking. So enough capital is there. Now, the exposure constant, what I was talking about, Pirida, similar is for other NBFCs also. That's the reason uh, in Ireda, we have decided to go for an IPO shortly. Before that, Government of India, is, uh, we have requested them to infuse 1500 crore liquidity and uh, PDIF to 500 we are planning to raise. So, which will enable enough space. So, not only Ireda, even other uh, REC, PFC, even uh, just a couple of days back, uh, PFC uh, has raised uh, from the market and their issue was quite, quite uh, successful. Even if you look at the IPO of NBFCs like Railway Finance Corporation and all, all are having overwhelming response. So the kind of uh, feeling what it was for NBFC earlier, it is not there right now. So therefore, I am very confident and uh, bullish on that. We have extreme good liquidity in the market now, and it is the ideal time to tap that and enable the uh, business partners, that is so-called borrowers, uh, to facilitate them, be it manufacturers, be it that, and uh, we have initiated apart from that fund based we are also supporting like we have decided to go for factoring of uh, business uh, yesterday only we had a couple of meeting with uh, esl energy efficiency services limited and they are very keen so they have the uh, invoice they have the guarantee from the government of goa and all but they don't have the liquidity with them so that we are now trying to pitch in that similarly this uh, as i said letter of undertaking we initiated in which replaced the bank guarantee where otherwise essentially the borrower has to deposit either 100% or 50% uh, to, at times even 100% with respect to their credit worthiness. But now that has become a history. We are giving our letter of undertaking. With that, a lot of liquidity has been mitigated to them. So I'm expecting capital will not be a problem at all. See, basically business is what? Bridge between supply and demand. We have huge demand for energy sector. And then we have huge supply in the form of deposits in the banks or banking sector today. And no other sector is having that much of growth. So therefore, in this sector, we don't foresee any capital problem. Thank right. you. Thank you very much for comments. Uh, and uh, Mr. Jane, you've come on. Radhika has just come on now. Mr. Jane, maybe I could give you, you the final word here before we probably have to start wrapping up. Yeah. So, you know, there are, what Mr. Das talked about was debt capital. And what the need of the capital is, the equity capital, mm -hmm. which is actually the first one to come and debt comes later on. So while I partially agree with Mr. Das that there is a lot of liquidity in the market, but the fact is, no matter the world markets talk about green bonds, green money, but the fact of the matter is there's only one color of money and nobody cares about whether it is going for sustainable development or it is going for uh, non-sustainable development, the cost of the capital is same, and accessibility to capital is exactly the same. Recently, of late, I've been seeing that there's a lot of commitment from private equity funds for ESG governance funds, capital. If the money and development is for the ESG, then there is capital available, but the cost remains same. My question today to all the NBFCs, banks and everything is, or for that matter to the government is, we need a different system of funding. We are going in for a wrong side of funding. We need to fund the under construction projects with the banks and NBFCs, because that's a short term capital. It can for short term life. And three years post operation, it should actually go into the bond yeah, or to yeah. the markets. And that is a sustainable model for financing. If you try to fund long-term projects of 25 years with short-term capital of banks and NBFCs, you'll always have trouble. So we Jeez. must look at that kind of a capital 
Right. Thank you. Thank I begin to, uh, if it's uh, the, uh, our respectable uh, participant, uh, speaker, say, uh, Mr. Jain, Irida is already having this facility, project specific funding, which is short term loan, which is for the construction cap uh, fund, uh, stage only. So, under construction project, Irida is having that policy. Even now, PFC and RIC has been mandated by Honorable uh, uh, Minister of Power and MNRE to have that policy. So NBFCs are already doing, and Irida has been doing this for quite long. And as a matter of fact, our couple of borrowers who have been uh, enabled this facility for, uh, to, for their survival impact. So it is already there. It is not, you know, that yeah, I don't agree that it is not there. And we are further strengthening it. And we have now dedicated division for looking into this activity. Well, thank you very much for coming back in on that question. I'd like to ask the panelists if anyone would like to come in on the question of microgrids. Um, if anyone has any uh, expertise in that area, as it was a question that came from the audience, we're um, very grateful for someone to pick up. I know we talked a little bit about um, feeding back into the grid as well. Um, that, that came from someone. If anyone would like to pick that question up, they're very they're most welcome uh, to do so. Um, and. I believe someone has just come off. I will. Um, if, if there's no takers for that particular question, um, I, I guess maybe if we've just got time for, for another question in here, which was just on um, just on the manufacturing side. Perhaps if um, if we could think about just how do we scale that manufacturing uh, nationally? Um, we heard about those those subsidies that were happening in the Chinese market. And, and also um, the need for thinking about um, uh, the remanufacture side of things as well. Perhaps if uh, Mr. Garuka is, is still on the line, what would it be? If, um, I'm not entirely sure if he is still on the line here today. Um, we can hear a little bit if anyone knew, has any thoughts on sort of scaling that national capacity um, to meet the demand. That would also be something I think would be really interesting to cover as well. Okay. Ah, yes. Mr. Chaudhry, uh, is that a question for yourself? Or would be yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, uh, manufacturing capabilities has been has been an issue for us a while. And mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, such kind of investment uh, will require a very long term commitment and a very long term sustainable demand. I think that is a cue. And uh, another thing is that something like a model which the Chinese the government has run a top runners uh, program where they focused on continuous technology upgradation, I think that is was something because there is a huge investment. And by the time you make an investment, your, your module capacity will get changed. So I think that continuous technology upgradation is actually in queue. When you're going for a such investment, I think you need to see it uh, two important factors. One is stability of the policies, reforms, a very long term demand. What is the supportive uh, mechanism for it? For example, recently a PLI uh, production linked incentive uh, program has been rolled out for it. There have been so uh, one is a facilitative part, one is a restrictive part. Duties etc. do the trick for the restrictive part, but the lot more focus need to be given for a facilitative part. So I think these all put together. Whereas uh, investment say that for a longer term, I have a demand for 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 my capacity I'm going to install. I mean that will do a lot more help. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up our, our session here. And I maybe just end on one remark just to sort of sum up. I think almost where we started is that for us, certainly we're seeing that, um, you know, the, the jobs and careers in uh, being part of the transition are just absolutely fantastic opportunities. And so there's a huge attraction to being a part of, um, of this movement going forward and really contributing. And I think when you put all those things together, um, we've got highly motivated, huge um, uh, pools of people really interested in getting involved um, and sort of taking this forward. So it's, it's uh, fits, uh, all starts to fit together in sort of making this real and making it happen. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you so much, our brilliant panel. Um, and with that, I will hand back to Radhika. Ms. Radhika, thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Greer and all our panelists uh, for those thoughts. I think uh, we've been able to establish what are the areas that perhaps need a little bit more attention, a little bit more thinking. And here's hoping that in the future, more such dialogues can continue and we can arrive at some solutions and innovations uh, to address some of the areas highlighted today. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're heading towards uh, our closing remarks by Mr. Pradeep Chaturvedi, uh, who is the Vice uh, President, Institute of Directors, India. But before that, I'd like to express uh, our gratitude to our partners and participants. Thank you all once again, uh, all our distinguished speakers for sparing their precious time and sharing their invaluable thoughts and insights, which have definitely made an impact on our IOD family. We would also like to thank all of our guests for joining us uh, at this uh, second edition of IOD India's Directors Dialogue Series, special focus on power and new and renewable energy sector. Once again, our special thanks and appreciation towards our principal strategic partner, ACCA, Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, the global body for professional accountants. We'd like to extend our warm gratitude towards our gold partners, the Gujarat Industrial Development Corporation, Borosil Renewables, GUVNL, that's Gujarat the Urja Vikas Nigam Limited, our silver partners uh, also deserve a word of appreciation. Thank you, uh, GACL, Gujarat Alkalis and uh, Chemicals Limited, Gujarat Gas, NHPC Limited. Uh, thank you to our associate partners as well, uh, MPIDC, uh, MP Industrial Development Corporation, SJVN, uh, Satluj Jal Vidyut Nigam Limited, Power Finance Corporation, EESL Energy Efficiency Services Limited, Avada Energy, and Gujarat Energy Development Agency. Thank you all very much for your continued support uh, to the Institute of Directors of India. Mr. Chaturvedi, it's over to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Radhika. Uh, I have been in this sector of the renewable energy ever since it started in India. Actually, the first village which was set up in India goes to my credit for designing and implementing it. So, uh, I have been very closely associated, and uh, let me tell you, today's discussion was really of a of a different class, where the directors of the different companies discussed about this transition. Uh, otherwise, we have uh, I have been on many committees, on many global committees on energy transitions, and those are the people who, uh, with the technical technical background, will speak about the transitions. But this is for the first time where I could hear the, the directors speaking about uh, how they look at it. We, uh, and I must say Mr. Greer had very, very clearly uh, summed up very well at the end with the capital innovations, but then transitions, local pictures and the micro grids are the four, four major issues that have been identified by, by the whole group. Since, since I have the opportunity to say, to say the last word, I'll, uh, say so that uh, we have to look at the whole macro and the micro pictures. These macro and the micro pictures are two separate issues. Right now, for the last four years, we have been in the, in the process of making the reports for the governments and saying as to what all changes need to be brought in. And uh, cap cap capital will capital will remain one of the major issues. We are, we are trying for the FDIs on a large scale, but the industries will have to search out for the capital. Similarly, for the, on the manufacturing side, uh, switching over to the manufacturing at the scales at which we need, this is the, is the issue. We have uh, we have signed and uh, have launched a 2,000 megawatt uh, project in Gujarat, but the whole project management and the aspect of it will be will remain a major challenge which has to be overcome. You know, in 2012. When they were deciding on the on the goals for the two sustainable development goals for 2030, they, they thought that uh, what they had missed over the last 20 years for video discussion from 1992 was the was the business partner. So they made business as an important fourth enabler, and they are looking that the businesses have to play an important role, which is supplementary to what the governments are doing, what the financial the international agencies are doing. So businesses have to reflect in the global and the golden peak of rewards uh, assessments. We have observed that ports have started playing their crucial role 
And uh, that's a very important issue. But let me tell you, I mean, so all those who have spoke this of uh, this evening, they have really given the insight into into how the boards will be looking into it, and it shows that our companies are quite geared up for the, for the occasion. In, uh, actually, at six o'clock, I was supposed to have started speaking at a at a forum at the global forum of the World Federation of Engine Organization and the UNESCO on engineering challenges for renewable energy transition to 2030. I told them I'll start in the two weeks. I thought, let me have the last word here before I have the first word in the other forum in, uh, in another two, three minutes. I would, on behalf of the Institute of Directors, I have great pleasure to thank Mr. Upen Tripathi, uh, who has been uh, extremely uh, instrumental in setting up many of these systems into the government on uh, development of the renewable energy. Mr. Ashish Upadhyay, who is the Additional Secretary and Financial Advisor, Ministry of Power. Mrs. Radhika Jha, IAS Secretary from the Uttarakhand State, having projected what the state, how the state government looks at it and how they could be really, in addition to what the central government is doing, how the state governments could be very, really, very really effective. And uh, we have, we are really honored to have listened to Mr. Uh, Sarabhai Patel, the Honorable Minister of Energy, Government of Gujarat, speaking about how Gujarat is taking the initiative for a long term and a, and a, um, and a very improved way of doing things in a big way. These galaxy of uh, speakers open out the discussion for us. Uh, obviously, the directors is really grateful. The stage that was set by them was really followed up by G.B. Greer, who, were, who, is, who has been a partner on behalf of the ACCA, which is a uh, constant partner of uh, of the Institute of Health for all important discussions. And he, today he played a very important role of moderating the discussion. And the eminent <laughs> speakers and the directors, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Das of the uh, IREJA, Mr. Vijay Karya of Ravin Group, Mr. Pradeep Hiruka of Borosil, Mr. Suman Sena of Renewbar, Sushil Sharma of SJVN, Mr. Sunil Jain of Hero Future, Mr. Prashant Chaudhary of Avada Group. They have added and presented the great, tremendous amount of uh, information, knowledge, and the way forward. These are, these are really the luminaries and the icons of this whole sector who have been in it for such a long time. Since I've been into it for the last 40 years, I know the contribution of each one of them. I mean, it's very rare to get this galaxy of people at one place, at one time, advising us as to what the Institute of Directors should be doing. And we'll, we'll be very happy to do all that they have suggested. And uh, we'll like them to be continuously associated. We'll be approaching all of them and we'll look forward to their continued support. Now, this event, this event could certainly be possible with the help, uh, you know, as any other big event that takes place uh, of uh, our ACCA, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, the global body of professional accountants, uh, which is our strategic, which was our strategic uh, partner. Uh, they have, they have been not, to, not only the the chartered uh, certified accountant, but they have played a very really important role on corporate governance in UK and worldwide. And with us, for, for a long time, there are constant partners and there's a knowledge partner too. The dual partners of the Gujarat Industrial Development Corporation, Borosil Renewable Energy Limited, Gujarat Uja Vikas Nigam, and a whole lot of industries from the Gujarat and the Silver Partners of the Indian Renewable Energy Agency Limited, Gujarat Alchemies and Chemicals Limited, Gujarat Gas Limited, NHPC, and Madhya Pradesh, Shetra Vidyut Vitran Company Limited. Our associate partners, the Madhya Pradesh Industrial Development Corporation, Satlu Jal Vidyut Nigam Limited, Power Finance Corporation, Energy Efficiency Services Limited, Outdoor Energy, uh, Gujarat Energy Development Agency, PHDC, India Limited, Gujarat Industries Power Corporation, Company Limited, Uttarakhand Power Corporation Limited, and the Karnataka Renewable 
technology limited. Uh, and our special thanks to Dhamudha Valley Cooperation World. We'll sending a large number of officers, more than 50 to be participating in it. Uh, the important thing to note is that this uh, central government, the Ministry of Power, the Renewable Energy, uh, uh, public sector undertaking from the central government, state governments, their public sector undertaking, and the private companies all have considered this as an important event, and everyone came forward and played and played a very important role. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tripathi right in the beginning on behalf of ISA. Uh, really what he presented was a picture, uh, in a business-like picture. He said that how the uh, how ISA would be working as an aggregator, which normally is a job which is done by commercial organizations. But the corporatization of ISA is, is the way forward. This is where how the the governments will be, the governments are supporting larger number of governments are coming in. Governments are also looking at it from that angle. So, therefore, we are, we are very happy that we picked up from the ECDS and then how we are meeting for many countries and trying to see how the cost can be brought down. This is also the ideology which was followed by China and many other countries to bring down the cost. But this is where uh, IAD is very really happy. We will, be, we will be trying to bring in all aspects of corporate governance into, into this whole thing. We will be very happy to work with the governments, with international organizations like ISA, with UNESCO, and all the whole lot of them. And uh, we will look forward to your continued help and support. And I can assure you, in another two minutes, I'll be speaking in this global forum under UNESCO, and I will carry some message from this to them also. And uh, we have uh, on behalf of our institute directors, I once again thank you all for your great help, support, and we look forward to your continued help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 